Good morning. I am Kenya McDuffie, Council Member for Ward 5 and Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. We are in room 412 of the John A. Wilson Building. The time is now 10.13 a.m. I'm calling the order this budget oversight hearing on the Committee on Government Operations. And today we'll be having hearings on four agencies, the Office of the Advisory Neighborhood Commissions, the Office of Campaign Finance, the Office of the Inspector General, and the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. Uh, as usual, we're going to be hearing from our public witnesses first and followed by our government witnesses. We're going to begin today by hearing from the Office of the Advisory Neighborhood Commissions. And I believe we have a couple of public witnesses. I don't see Michael Syndrome here, but I do see uh, uh, Gigi Ransom, who's here this morning. So I'm going to call you up to testify. And if there are any other public witnesses who have not signed up to testify on the Office of Advisory Neighborhood Commission. Now, Ms. Ransom, we'll begin with you. And you're going to have uh, three minutes to give your testimony, followed by any questions I might have. Good morning to you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Albert E. Ransom, former commissioner for Single Member District 5806. Uh, for the record, I've served six terms as elected ANC, three times in Ward 6 in the 90s, and three times currently uh, were done in Ward 5. Uh, since the 90s, I've witnessed the evolution of the D.C. Council and the executive branch of our government, both which have made, which have made tremendous strides prior to, through, and after the congressionally imposed Financial Control Board, to which both branches should be commended. Uh, government agencies were realigned, uh, reorganized to be more effective and efficient in services, service deliveries with more accountability. However, with only some minor changes being made in 2000 for the Advisory Navy Commissioners, in spite of well-heard complaints, they have remained essentially the same uh, to date. Uh, at one time, the budget was uh, prior in the 90s, late 90s, the budget for the ANCs was $1.1 $1 .1 million. Uh, after, after, with, through the co control board experience, it was reduced to $800,000. Uh, I believe we're still currently at the level of $500,000 for ANC commissions, and there are now 40 commissions with 295 commissioners. But that amount, you have to deduct the $200,000 plus maybe for the operations of the office of the ANCs. Um, I've added some other things since you only gave me a minute or so. But um, I had some concerns about uh, financial management, uh, how that's handled by the auditor's office. Uh, there's also how ANCs are funded. Uh, we have commissions that have offices, may not receive, uh, may only receive about three, four thousand dollars uh, a quarter uh, to pay for these types of things. And I believe now today, where all the other agencies have been um, with the realignment and how the funding, uh, the budgeting goes for each of these agencies, the same should be looked at for ANCs, whereas, for example, the, the rent for a office space that cannot be found on public space. Um, uh, should not should be in addition to whatever is budgeted for them. I've made some recommendations based on issues with the grants and other operations, as you'll see in my testimony. And one thing is definitely clear: there may be there should be a need for a some type of chief financial officer to review quarterly reports before they are submitted. I believe the Office of ANC should have to submit monthly reports as to their services rendered, status of service requests, year-to-date budget spending, et cetera, placed on the website, along with the ANC handbook, uh, the use of a qualified staff person to serve as the attorney for ANC matters, um, bulk supplies, both purchases of similar supplies uh, that will be distributed to each of the commissions for efficient use of taxpayer funds, uh, clear rulemaking for the use of the funds in itself and especially for the um, grants. Uh, there is no rulemaking. There are s the rules are broad, and um, you don't find out till after the auditor gets to that quarter report, which may be depending uh, a month or two after you've submitted it. 
uh, that there's concerns about certain expenditures. And um, that's a, a real issue, especially we found out in 5C, the prior 5C, prior to the redistricting. Um, and I provided you information. Oh, standardized, standardizing the applications for uh, grants, which should also include in the guidelines some sign-offs on the guidelines in addition to the grant. And also, I believe, based on the, my experience, especially as the treasurer of 5C, that um, there should be within the grant document some type of a uh, notice from the auditor and the ANC, I mean the uh, OAG, advising the grantee that they will be held accountable based on if the council decides to change that section of the ANC codes uh, that holds, in essence, holds the ANC responsible for any receipts uh, that are not submitted with their quarterly report, which allows for deductions. And there's no due process uh, as to uh, some type of a format or method uh, when an ANC does attempt to collect and the uh, recipient or the commissioner uh, that gets reimbursed and et cetera does not provide the documentation or reimburse the funds. Uh, there's no process uh, to submit to, say, the auditor or to uh, that it's uncollectible as far as the uh, position of the ANC, the rules and regulations regarding the ANCs are concerned, and that it should either be forwarded to a collection agency or to the OAG and or the OAG, depending on the, on the circumstances, and the funds not deducted. Because as you know, uh, we've had serious problems. We have one grantee in particular that owed the ANC uh, close to 15, I believe it was $15,000 that we did not collect on. If you'd like to talk about it, we can. I, after a year, I submitted it to, well, I submitted a full detailed report, about a three or six page report, to the auditor with, all, with about 28 uh, pages of support documentation that clearly made, made it clear that we could not collect. However, that amount was still deducted from our uh, from the ANC allotment, and will be paid. That ANC, uh, our ANC was scheduled to pay through uh, FY14, uh, and whether or not it should be passed on to the uh, uh, the new redistricted commission. And the same holds true for uh, ANC 5B uh, in another matter where there was theft of the funds, as you know. And there is a newly formed ANC 5B um, that does not contain, also does not have any of the old commissioners from the former ANC 5B, yet they are being held accountable for what the former commission did. They have to go down to the auditor's office to write checks and things like that. And it's, it's just not fair. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Ransom. Uh, you listed nine things on here. Is there any, uh, the way did you list them, in your opinion, is this the priority in which they should, they should happen? If I had to pick one or two of these things, which ones are most important, do you think? To the I bank? think as far as the overall reporting, uh, the, the quarterly reports submitted by ANCs, and again, with the time lag between when the auditor gets to them or may, the person assigned, the ANC, uh, is it the specialist or whatever, uh, the time that it takes for them to review, which is now, once was, I think it was 30-something commissions last year, it's 40 now. Uh, to go through all of them, uh, deep to spend the time, depending on the, uh, the death of the report. For example, for me, when I was the treasurer in 2011, and we did give a lot of grants, uh, at one time I submitted a quarter report of about over 350 pages, because they also asked for any communications regarding the, the application, um, uh, any communications, um, the minutes, uh, let's see, and there's some other documentation. And by the time we submitted the quarterly report, of course, they were supposed to submit the financial statement for that grant. So that may be included depending on the timeline, because we had a 30-day requirement. Uh, we cut that from a 60-day requirement. And um, with all of the documentation, the receipts, et cetera, that have to go with it, I winded up at one quarter, I think it was the third quarter, FY11, that I had over 350 pages that I had to copy and whatnot. And then 
uh, I revealed some of the issues uh, that came out, and of course the auditor then found other issues. I was particularly uh, focused on the grants. So uh, someone needs to really go through, uh, say a chief financial officer with the commissions uh, prior to the submission to the auditor, that chief financial officer should be able to play a role too in identifying problem situations and then the reporting to the auditor, OAG, IG, whoever, and the council. Is there any, and, and I know that the, what you had in number nine, uh, changes in the ANC law regarding grants that hold the ANC responsible for the lack of receipts from the grantee to the grantee being held accountable. Uh, it's, in your opinion, is it, is it a situation where grants are being awarded and you've got some grantees who are non-compliant and it still sort of falls back on the ANC um, where, in, in, and I guess it's your opinion that uh, these, these individual um, grantees should be held uh, responsible if they don't comply with uh, providing receipts of expenditures and whatever information they're supposed to provide to the ANC Commission because you all or ANC commissions really have uh, very little enforcement when it comes to trying to get folks to comply. Yeah, no, well, we have no enforcement once we issue the check. Um, and we may discuss certain matters. We've changed at one point where we, for certain vendors or certain items that they requested, uh, to avoid that problem, we wrote the checks to the companies uh, for that specific purpose. So we got something back uh, in return. However, for other expenditures, it sometimes did not work out that way. And then there were the circumstances when uh, a grantee, uh, like that $15,000 one, when, especially after we issued the $12,000, close to $200 check uh, for a specific program, uh, nothing was ever turned in uh, to us. And the section of the codes that apply to that come under the ANC uh, funds audit of account, employees, financial reports, publications, DC Code 1-309.13, no quarterly allotment shall be forwarded to a commission until all reports of financial activities for the quarters preceding the immediate quarter are approved by the auditor. And it was told to me more than once, um, a report is not approved unless it, fully approved unless it has all of the receipts. Uh, they have made determinations just to do deductions uh, based on whatever they consider that outstanding amount to be uh, that did not have a receipt. However, the, what concerns me is that the taxpayer is hit twice, and I don't know if they fully realize it. When we issue the grant, and then the auditor comes back and deducts the entire amount again, and I think that is totally unfair. Uh, in your opinion, is the training that ANC commissioners receive uh, at, at the beginning when they're elected, is, is that sufficient? Do you think there needs to be any additional training, maybe specific to uh, whomever is going to serve in the capacity as treasurer, uh, just in terms of how you comply with uh, the reporting and things of that nature? You think that's that's done by the uh, auditor's office, separate from the basic ANC training that new commissioners receive. And then sometimes, I believe, uh, as Mr. Simon will share with you, I believe there's also one for returning uh, commissioners. However, when you limit uh, this type of information to only the treasurer, the chair, uh, and then how they share it, um, uh, can sometimes be some miscommunication. Uh, the, from what I recall from the handbook I received from the auditor's office, it's based more so on their rules uh, and regulations uh, or how they set up the standard. But there is, again, uh, there's no, I'll say, leeway given uh, or any document, uh, any type of a, a full section regarding grants. Uh, for example, too, uh, with the grants, um, say a, um, uh, at one time we authorized, we approved a grant for a, um, it was called a toy giveaway, a uh, Christmas toy giveaway. However, it was closely related to an educational support program that was provided by the entity to the children that received these gifts. Uh, or. Uh, these um, uh, educational tools. Uh, there were uh, books, 
she did all this, some uh, computers or whatever the game, computerized games that uh, were educationally based. Uh, other items along that line, coloring books, and it was for different age groups and whatnot. And, but the person did also buy some toys, which I don't want to call them toys. They were toys, uh, but they, for older kids, they could be used for the educational purpose, we thought. And um, we decided, it was over $5,000, uh, we decided that, um, uh, that uh, the ANC decided that it would absorb that portion of the grant. The grant was maybe close to $15,000, too. And by the way, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chairman, after uh, I think when uh, Commissioner Alexander, Council Member Alexander had oversight of the ANC, she said that there should be a $5,000 limit. Uh, but we never received anything official or w whether it was done by legislation to have that kind of a limit placed on the awarding of grants. We had money. Others do not, did not have the money. We didn't have an office uh, from about, I believe, 2003. That was prior to me coming on 5C. So they were using the funds to award grants. I don't have any additional questions, but I do appreciate your testimony. I appreciate uh, the recommendations that you've laid out, and I'll take the, the committee will take those recommendations under advisement. Um, so thank you. All right. Thanks, At this point, we're going to move on to our government witness. If we could have a director of the Office of NCs, Mr. Gottlieb Simon, come forward. And while you're stepping forward, Mr. Simon, I'll just say, which I probably should have said before, uh, that the Office of the Advisory Neighborhood Commissions was created to provide technical, administrative, and financial reporting assistance to the district's advisory neighborhood commissions. Uh, further, the office is intended to support the efforts of the commissions, but is not empowered to direct or supervise the actions of commissions. The office is funded by an annual budget allocation, and the FY14 operating budget request is approximately $895,000, an increase of approximately $2,000. In addition, the office is not requesting an increase in FTEs and intends to execute its mission in this year 14 with 2.5 FTEs. If you could uh, please stand and raise your right hand, Mrs. Simon. If, if you could please stand and raise your right hand, I want to swear you in before we get started. Thank you. Uh, do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please be seated, and whenever you're ready, you can begin. Good morning, Mr. Duffin. Thank you. Uh, and my name is, uh, for the record, Gottlieb Simon. I'm Executive Director of the Office of Advisory Neighborhood Commissions. And I'm here today to discuss the DX0, or Advisory Neighborhood Commission, section of the proposed 2014 budget. Like the ANCs themselves, this section of the budget is unique. In reality, it contains two separate components. One component is the budget request for the now 40 Advisory Neighborhood Commissions, which is shown in Category 50 subsidies and transfers. The other component is the budget for the Office of Advisory Neighborhood Commissions, OANC, which provides support for the commissions and which in the language of the budget is referred to as the Agency Management Program. Overall, except for a slight increase in personal services, this is a status quo budget. Support for the 40 ANCs will continue at the same level as in FY13 approximately $677,000. In FY 2009, however, the ANCs collectively were allotted $850,000. Although this represented the largest allotment in over a decade, it was still less than the historic highs the ANCs reached in FY 1995. In that budget, there was $1,196,000 allotted for the ANCs themselves. The proposed FY14 budget keeps the allocation for the ANCs unchanged from FY13 at $677,000, but this is only a little more than half the amount that was approved for FY95, and it does not take into account inflation over the last 18 years. In accordance with the requirements of the Home Rule Charter, this money will be distributed 
to the ANCs on a per capita basis. The larger the ANC's population, the larger its share of the total. If an ANC has 2.4% share of the citywide population, which is the population of the typical sized ANC, it will receive 2.4% of the total allotment. In FY 2009, this meant that each ANC was allotted approximately a dollar and a half for each person who lived in their neighborhood. Currently, ANCs receive approximately a dollar thirteen per neighborhood resident. While ANCs vary widely in size, the typical ANC has seven single member districts. Since each SMD on average comprises 2,000 people, the typical ANC made up of seven SMDs has a population of roughly 14,000. Thus, the typical allotment in FY 2009 was roughly $20,000. In FY 2013, it fell to a little over 15,000. This translates into a nearly 25% cut from 2009 to 2013, experienced by each Advisory Neighborhood Commission. The lion's share of the DX0 budget line is accounted for by these annual allotments to the ANCs. The remaining funds cover the operating costs of the Office of Advisory Neighborhood Commissions. In FY 2014, this amounts to approximately $217,000 and represents the salaries for 2.5 employees. Unfortunately, however, after natural growth and salaries and benefits are taken into account, nothing has been left for next year's budget for any other office expenses. The purpose of the OANC funding, of course, is to provide technical and administrative support to the 40 ANCs and the commissioners of the 296 single member districts. This support includes the training of new commissioners at the beginning of each term and then throughout the term as new commissioners are brought in to fill vacancies. Our work also includes the updating and preparation of the ANC handbook and other information during the course of each term. We manage the various programs for the commissioners such as the parking pass program and the ANC email. We provide websites to participating commissions and train and assist them in their operation and maintenance. We assist the ANCs in meeting their financial reporting responsibilities, including helping them in determining their payroll obligations if they hire staff. The office also assists ANCs with the, re with the running of special elections to fill midterm vacancies. We provide information about the ANCs to other agencies and to the public. And finally, we provide ongoing advice to individual commissioners and commissions on a range of issues from avoiding conflicts of interest to generating interest and ameliorating conflicts. Before I close, allow me to mention some problems that have developed with the ANC's allotments. The ANCs receive their allotments in four quarterly payments. Before another allotment is released by the CFO, the auditor must approve an ANC's financial report documenting how they have spent a prior quarter's allotment. To motivate the ANCs to submit their reports to the auditor in a more timely fashion, the Council amended the ANC law some years ago to say that if an ANC had not received all of its funds that it was due by the end of the quarter, by the end of the fiscal year, because it failed to file a quarterly report approved by the auditor, it would forfeit those funds and the funds would be returned to the general fund. At the end of the year, for the last several years, the auditor has asked the CFO to, quote, accrue the payments to most of the ANCs because the auditor's office had not finished reviewing all of the quarterly reports. In November 2011, after the fiscal year had ended, the auditor had the occasion to ask the Office of the Attorney General if this practice of accruing payments to the ANCs while their reports were under review was legal. The OAG replied that the literal reading of the law said no. If the auditor had not approved an ANC's reports by the end of the fiscal year, that ANC would have to forfeit the funds even if they had turned in their reports before the year ended. As a consequence, ANC's 1B, 1A, 5B, and 8D all forfeited some of their FY 2011 allotments. Indeed, ANC 5B forfeited all four of its allotments for this reason. The ANCs appealed to the auditor saying that they had relied on direction from the auditor's office itself 
and that they could receive their funds, that they could receive their funds as long as they were submitted before September 30th, in keeping with historic practice. The auditor expressed sympathy for the plight of the ANC's constituents, but maintained, in view of the OAG's advice, that her hands were tied. Certainly, the ANCs are not entitled to funds if they fail to meet their responsibilities to submit the reports. At the same time, it does not seem equitable to deny them funds if the auditor or CFO or some other agency is unable to fulfill their functions by the end of the fiscal year. I therefore recommended last year that the Committee on Aging and Community Affairs, which then had oversight responsibility for the ANCs, to consider amending the ANC law so that ANCs do not have to forfeit funds as long as they have submitted their reports in a timely fashion. Councilmember Berry subsequently introduced Bill 19886 to correct this problem. Unfortunately, the hearing on this bill had to be canceled due to unrelated considerations and it could not be rescheduled before the end of the term last year. ANC 7E had a different but related problem. To be approved by the auditor, an ANC's quarterly report must be signed by the ANC's treasurer and chairperson and by the secretary whose signature certifies that the ANC approved the quarterly report at a properly noticed ANC meeting. During FY11, a majority of ANC 7E commissioners voted to approve two quarterly reports that were due by September 30, 2011, the end of the fiscal year. According to all involved, the Commission did this, but the Secretary, for reasons unrelated to the certification of the vote, declined to sign the reports. The two reports, with all their documentation, were delivered to the Auditor's Office well before the end of the fiscal year on March 11 and June 7, 2011, respectively. With the signatures of the Chairperson and the Treasurer, but without the Secretary's signature, the auditor informed the ANC in January of last year that the ANC's reports could not be processed without the secretary's signature and that the ANC would therefore forfeit both quarterly allotments or half a year's funding. I then wrote to the OAG asking whether the secretary's signature might be viewed simply as a ministerial act that would not prevent the Commission from receiving its allotment. Again, the OAG concluded that the literal language meant that the auditor was within her authority to decline approval of the reports. The OAG, however, went on to observe, quote, the Council, of course, is free to modify the signature requirement if it determined to unwisely cause ANC funds to be dependent upon the whims of one Commission official. Accordingly, I suggested that the Committee on Aging and Community Affairs consider a change that would allow the substitution of the Vice Chairperson's signature in the event that the Secretary was unable or unwilling to sign the report, alternatively allowing certification by the Chairperson and the Treasurer might be sufficient. This change was also included in Councilmember Berry's bill. Accordingly, I would respectfully recommend that, the, that this Committee consider reintroduction of that or similar legislation. And with that, uh, that concludes my prepared testimony, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Simon. The bill that you mentioned, uh, that Councilmember Barry introduced, Bill 19-886, did that address both problems that you outlined? Uh, yes, sir, okay. both problems. Okay. I want to begin by asking you just a couple of questions about um, some of the documents um, uh, around the budget. One uh, is, and I don't know if you have this document before you, but in, in the section entitled uh, Regular Pay Other, yes. on the chart uh, on the Agency Management Fiscal Year 14 Spending Plan, uh, is this section um, and the funds associated with this section primarily to compensate your part-time uh, employer? Or does this serve uh, some sort of, uh, some other purpose? Yes, uh, we have two full-time employees. Their uh, salaries are indicated in the line called regular, I believe. Okay. 
and we have one half-time part-time employee, and that's in the other line. In your fiscal year 13 ANC spending plan, your subsidies and transfers are, are, are fairly detailed. And there's a line item spreadsheet of the expenditures you have made to, to each commission. However, the commissions do not receive an equal distribution of funds. And you, you touched on it a bit uh, in your testimony, but I was hoping you can elaborate a little bit more on the rationale um, supporting the distribution of funds to each ANC commission. Surely. We have currently 40 commissions, which is up from the 37 we have for many years. Uh, and each year the council allots a certain amount of money to go to cover the expenses of all of the ANCs. Uh, putting aside the Home Rule Charter for just a second, the ANCs vary in their size and population and so therefore in the number of single member districts that they have. Our largest ANCs currently have 12 single member districts. Our smallest ANCs have two and three single member districts. So were we to cut the allotment pie, so to speak, into 40 slices, clearly uh, there would be a lot more for uh, uh, ANCs with two or three single member districts to consume per capita than there would be for the uh, ANCs with 12. So uh, I think it, on a pie-eating basis, if nothing else, one can see that it would be somewhat inequitable for some ANCs to have a huge slice relative to the number and for others to have a tiny slice. But all of that uh, metaphor aside, the Home Rule Charter does direct us to distribute the funds on a per capita basis such that uh, the ANC should receive its share of funding in accordance with its share of the total city population. So that's what accounts for uh, the difference that goes from one ANC to another, but hopefully, although uh, the shares are not equal, they are equitable. No, I think that uh, does a good job of explaining it, in case there are folks at home who are, who are wondering about that. Uh, you're not requesting any funds for uh, supplies or materials uh, this, this fiscal year. However, uh, in FY13, you requested approximately $1,342. And I wanted to know if, if, if what's the basis for not requesting um, any additional money for materials and supplies? Well, uh, I should indicate that uh, that isn't what I'm requesting. Uh, that is, in fact, what's in the budget. And we did, in fact, uh, uh, ask for uh, an enhancement, I think is the current term of art, uh, for additional funds, but that was not accepted. Uh, the problem that uh, uh, I have as the titular agency director for the ANCs is that the uh, funds for the DX0, as I indicated before, are really made up of two parts. One part is for the operation of the office that I direct. The other part is for the funds that are given to the advisory neighborhood commissions. And it would be, uh, at the very least, inappropriate, and I don't think uh, proper, uh, for me to alter, one way or the other, the funds that are going to the ANCs. And so that only leaves the uh, funds for the operation of the office itself that I can uh, reasonably make recommendations regarding. And in order to uh, satisfy the cap that the budget office provided, uh, we were, f and to meet the requirements uh, created by step increases and the natural growth of salaries, uh, the only place left to make any discretionary moves were supplies and all of the non-personal services except for the ANC's funds themselves. So uh, last year we moved some in that direction and left a little bit, and this year there was nothing left to move. So that's uh, the reason that there is nothing in 20 and 40, those budget lines, though we would certainly uh, think it would be uh, desirable if there were funds there. Does it, how, how much if you had a magic wand uh, in that area would be needed 
Well, we go back to uh, 2012 levels. And what was the 2012 level? That's what I mentioned earlier, the 1,342? Uh, I think that, that was... Actually, that's 13. 2013, yes. So what was 2012, do you recall? It, approximately. You don't have to have the number. Uh, I believe it was a, a, a total of 5,000. Spread between uh, 20 and 40. You also uh, mentioned on the performance oversight hearings before this committee that um, your staff manages special elections if there are any vacancies. And I'd like to know if there are any costs associated with, with this function. The costs associated with the special elections? Are, are there any costs associated with the special elections? If so, how much? Uh, not that we break out. Uh, we prepare uh, copies of the voter list. We generate the ballots. And uh, the most expensive aspect would simply be uh, staff time that would be allotted to those activities. But the, uh, the paper, I assume, is, is, is nominal. And so it's just to assume that whenever you have a special election, whatever the costs associated with this special are absorbed within your budget? Yes, we, we absorb those costs in the, in the general operation of the office. Uh, do you have any idea, just on average, how many special elections occur within any fiscal year? Um, in the first year and a half, we have two or three a month. And then we reach a point where it is too close to the next general election, and uh, we can't hold any more uh, special elections. But uh, uh, things happen. Uh, for instance, Commissioner uh, uh, Ransom, who spoke just a while ago, uh, had a circumstance, and she was forced to move. And when she moved, uh, she wasn't able to maintain residency in her single-member district, and her seat became vacant. So lots of things happen uh, throughout the year that require uh, filling of a vacancy. We had one death at the beginning of this year already, uh, and people move. Okay. And, and it doesn't matter how, how many of these special elections that you have within a, within a year, you're still going to absorb the costs associated with them? Yeah, we will still uh, absorb the cost of the election, right? When a commission uh, doesn't expend all of the money dispersed uh, within a fiscal year, the money remains in the commission's account. Is that correct? Uh, if they do not expend all the money that has been allotted, that money uh, remains in their account until ex until expended. And that's, that's indefinitely, the money remains in the account. That is correct. And uh, it was, uh, that's been the case since the ANCs were established. And it was uh, a matter of pride. <coughs> I remember very clearly among the, the first uh, group of commissioners that they were freed from the sort of spend it or lose it um, uh, mentality and uh, incentive that they had experienced in their role, in their other roles in life. So. Uh, the ANCs are in a better position to, to hold the money for a good cause. And do you see any, any, any problems with that, with that practice? Or any, are, there, are there benefits to allowing that to happen? Is there any thought that the money should be returned? Or is the office of the ANCs uh, fine with the practice of the, the monies remaining? Well, uh, I, I think it, it would be a better practice uh, to allow the funds to remain with the ANC than to say if you don't spend it this year, you lose it, because that I think would just provide incentive to less thoughtful expenditures. Now, we did reach a point some years ago, um, and without getting into all of the reasons that we got to that point where the ANCs seem to have uh, a substantial amount of money uh, in their uh, savings account and the thought had been raised well maybe we should 
claw back, to use the term at that time, these funds and put them back in the general fund. And it, after some wide discussion, uh, it seemed that a better approach would be simply to put a moratorium on the accounts of those ANCs that seem to have uh, too large a surplus than it would be to reduce the overall allotment to the ANCs. So ha should we need to go in some direction, uh, I think that would be a preferable direction than um, taking unspent money back. And, and currently, um, you've got 2.5 FTEs, and that's not going to change the proposed fiscal year 14 uh, budget. Are, are the 2.5 FTEs that you have sufficient to address um, the duties and responsibilities that come along with the office? I know that you field a lot of questions from ANC commissioners. You have folks that drop in uh, to, to speak with members of your staff. Uh, are the levels that you're at right now in terms of the FTEs adequate to perform your duties? We are somewhat um, underwater at the moment with uh, the uh, requests that have come in and our ability to fulfill all of them. And you also mentioned in your testimony that your office provides um, websites to the ANCs. Uh, does every single ANC have a website? No. Okay, just those who request it or uh, does it work? Yes, uh, we offer, uh, uh, we sometimes initiate an offer, occasionally a commission will ask for one. Um, ANCs represent a wide range and reflect all of the diversities of the city, I like to tell people. So there are some that are highly technologically oriented and others not so much. And so we have uh, some ANCs that have generated uh, very um, uh, ambitious websites on their own. Uh, others are using a, a, a website that we've put together, which doesn't require uh, any uh, outside knowledge of HTML programming or complicated web activities, but does allow the basic information about when the ANC meets, who are the commissioners, what are their uh, minutes, uh, when the next meeting is, and uh, important documents such as their minutes and things of that sort. But there are a few that are uh, not uh, uh, inclined uh, to do that yet. In terms of the websites and the emails, what, what's the cost to the office in providing that? Is, is there a cost to your office or is there a cost to some other office? For the websites? For the websites and the emails. No. Uh, the uh, websites are, are produced in-house, so it's just, you know, whatever imputed staff time you put to that. Uh, and as far as the email, we have an agreement with Octo that uh, they provide the email accounts at ANC dc.gov, uh, and we provide the help desk and training uh, aspects. Okay. Former Commissioner Ransom, who testified before you, um, she listed nine recommendations, and, and I know you were here. I don't know if you heard uh, her recommendations, but there were a couple that we talked about. Um, uh, in particular, there, there was one that she suggested there should be changes in the ANC law regarding grants that hold the ANC responsible for the lack of receipts from a grantee and shift that to the grantee being held res accountable uh, uh, for not providing information or documentation. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we do have a, at the very least, anomalous situation. The quarter report requirement is that every expenditure be uh, su um, supported with documentation, and the ANC law requires that every grant uh, be the subject of a written proposal, and it further requires that within 60 days of receiving the grant, a grantee is to provide the ANC with a report on the use of those funds and copies of all receipts. Problem, and then the ANC is supposed to append that material to the quarterly report 
for the period in which the grant was written. The problem is that sometimes the grantee does not turn over that information to the ANC. The literal reading uh, of the law then directs the auditor to not approve a report or alternatively, more likely, to approve the report but to disallow the expenditures associated with a grant that is not fully supported and documented. So we have an ANC which does uh, what it's supposed to do, but we have a grantee that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, but it is the ANC that winds up being penalized. And so that is an inequitable uh, situation. Some of the ANCs have attempted to cope with this by not writing a check directly to a grantee any longer. They ask the grantee to indicate who their vendors are, and the ANC writes the check directly to the vendor. And then that uh, alleviates the requirement or the dependence upon the grantees to submit it. But without getting more lost in any of these details, yes, we do have a situation that uh, uh, requires some improvement. And do you have any suggestions for how you improve that? How do we improve that? Yes. Well, um, there are several possibilities, and I think we'd like to uh, uh, see which ones the ANCs would find to be the most appropriate, but they include things such as uh, perhaps limits on the size of the grant, because some of the ANCs have gotten into uh, a difficulty because the grants were simply so large. Uh, the next issue would have to do with uh, the timetable on how long it takes to return the, the uh, receipts. Next issue would have to do with uh, whether or not the commission should be held in any way uh, liable for the missing documentation. All expenditures have to be documented. The ANC's documentation for the grant comes from the grantee. Uh, it follows, therefore, if the missing grant, uh, missing document, if there is missing documentation, the expenditure is disallowed. And when an expenditure is disallowed, the amount of that expenditure is subtracted from an upcoming uh, allotment. Uh, clearly, somebody has to uh, continue to be held accountable. We wouldn't want a situation in which uh, funds are given to the ANC, the ANC writes a grant, the grantee decides not to give anybody any uh, documentation, the ANC is free from uh, any accountability. Uh, so we need to do uh, something about that. I'm not prepared at the moment without uh, talking it over more with the commissions uh, to, to select one uh, approach over the other. Okay. And when you've had opportunity to talk it over with the commissions, I think it's something that I'd like to return to just to see uh, what recommendations or, or suggestions would be appropriate to, to implement to try to address that. Because uh, while I agree with you that somebody should be held accountable, uh, I see it to, to be a challenge to the ANCs where they really lack enforcement uh, uh, over the grantees to, to compel certain information. And so to penalize the ANCs, which in turn penalizes the residents and the constituents within that, that ANC, uh, is something that we should probably think about uh, creatively what we could do to address that. So I don't have any additional questions uh, for you, Mr. Simon. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to the record before we conclude? Not at this time. Well, thank you so much for your testimony. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. And next we're going to have testimony from our public witnesses on the Office of Campaign Finance. And we've got one public witness who is uh, signed up to testify, and that's Michael Syndrome. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Syndrome, you can uh, begin your testimony whenever you are ready. Michael Syndrome, disabled veteran, served our country more than most. I'd like to weigh in with Advisory Neighborhood Commission, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair. I can do many things in life, but I can't be two places at the same time. And your colleague had a Washington Metro Area Transit Authority uh, hearing, so I just uh, departed. 
as I said, and I've used this act, and my organization, uh, DC Justice for All, which can be accessed, dcjusticeforall.org, I believe under committee uh, guideline rules that should uh, entitle me to five minutes, but be that as it may, the art of good governance, accountability, rule of law, and transparency. Uh, and the mantra of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission is to bring people closer to the government and government closer to the people. There is an instance I know of that an ANC grant was granted, no pun intended, ANC 4A. It was given to Denise Rhodes trading as Digital Dynamo. It was in the amount of $2,000. This is when we had the digital conversion. And grant was given and then rescinded. Now, Mr. Simon makes certain representations uh, favorable to ANC, but you know what is good for the goose is good for the gander. It also should apply to the commission as well, because nothing was ever given to Ms. Rhodes, the grantee, in terms of the grant being rescinded. I pushed the envelope. We had a hearing of one uh, board member to contest this. And by law, when there's an adverse decision and I timely file and perfect my appeal, which I have done, I am then entitled to a full complement of the uh, Board of Elections. That has yet to happen. And, you know, I've brought this to your committee's attention, and I'd like some action, you know, to be taken. Because justice delayed is indeed justice denied. You asked a query of Mr. Simon about what can best enhance the auditor. And I would make a suggestion there is needed an intermediate level of auditing review. Who can oversee what's being approved and what's being disapproved? Because from where I sit, and of course where you sit, where you stand depends on where you sit, is that uh, it appears to me the auditors ANC, you know, are in bed together. Sad but true. And again, the lopsided presentation picture painted by uh, Mr. Simon, you know, favorable to ANC, uh, doesn't give the totality of all that's happened in terms of grantees. Like I say, in this instance with Ms. Rhodes, nothing in writing which the law requires. And I might add, the chair at the time was using his official company time, United States Department of Agriculture, firing off missives, emails, and whatnot, which is no-no. That ought not be. And then he had the audacity at this one uh, member hearing to indicate his computer crashed. So he had nothing to verify what was done or what wasn't done. But I can tell you unequivocally, nothing in writing was given to this grantee, meaning that rescission of the grant is unlawful. Might also mention, and I, I believe I brought this to your attention previously, while um, Ms. Bowser, Muriel Bowser, was ANC treasurer of, of 4B in the 0506, all the records have gone. They have evaporated, disappeared, right? She was treasurer. I requested copies of the auditor, copies of the checks and the financial quarterly reports. They've not been forthcoming. And it's like pulling teeth. And then they say, well, you've got to pay hundreds of dollars for a FOIA request. That ought not be. I was under the understanding we were going to have a transparent, accountable, responsible government under rule of law. As it relates to Ms. Bowser, that's not happening. Again, she was ANC treasurer from uh, 05 to 06. In fact, I recall there was a grant given to Peaceaholics, which do not operate in Ward 4, which she currently represents. She categorically denied on the record. Later, she said, yeah, we did write a grant for $1,000 to them, which should be, you know, returned. Um, so I think these things need further deliberation and review by you and the committee. Briefly, uh, regarding Office of Campaign Finance, um, there are two matters. The one I've referred to, Denise Rhodes. The other involves an ANC chair, uh, 4A, who has used the ANC office, he happens to be an attorney too, to receive mail. He also sits on a number of nonprofits, and grants have been granted to those respective nonprofits. Clearly, conflict of interest. So there are two hearings on tap with the full complement of the board. Uh, they were timely filed and perfected under the reign of Togo West. As soon as Harry Thomas issue from Ward Five, you know, uh, hit the press, uh, Mr. West sought fit to bow out. I wish he was still there because I believe a lot of loose ends would have been tied up. But uh, currently. Uh, the uh, current chair and complement need to take this, you know, seriously, and we need to have an expedited hearing advanced on calendar to the earliest participable date to aid in the decisional process. That's what the law requires. Again, the art of good governance, accountability, rule of law, and transparency. Mr. Syndrome, if you could uh, please summarize. Uh, I think uh, with the time that we've given and the time you went over, it's about five minutes now. 
So if you could, I really appreciate it. Certainly. In, uh, and it may bring, it brings sorrow to my heart and yours as well. The examiner is going to be closing up shop in town come uh, mid-June. Not good. They have really kept various government agencies and this council's feet to the fire. I want to conclude with a comment made in the examiner April the 19th. Shiny facades and internal chaos. District elected officials have cited balanced budgets and Wall Street credit ratings as indicators they have handled the city's finances masterfully. But behind those shiny facades are internal control problems screaming for attention. I'm going to pass up this article and I'll let you and the committee staffers peruse it at your convenience. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, if any got any qu uh, questions at this time, be delighted to field them. Thank you uh, for your testimony, Mr. Syndrome. I, I don't have any questions for you at this time, uh, but I do appreciate your testimony, and I will note that there is another hearing going on uh, at the same time, so I appreciate you coming over to testify. While we're talking about budget, too, if I, I may interject, uh, Mr. Chair, this trolley folly. I know it's going to, you know, uh, help out Ward 5, but I hail from Ward 4, and across town it's going to be a limited portion, and moreover, a $400 million price tag. Let's best put that money into the train and buses which services all, notwithstanding that first responders, the police and firefighters are going to have to redirect their route to get the fires. The you commit a purse snatching along that 8th Street corridor northeast, right? For, for law enforcement problematic, you hop on a trolley, see a Glen Eye got to be a. The uh, spatial constraints with parking, we already have limited parking as it is. Those trolley files are going to take up much more space. Thank and notwithstanding, if we have a derecho again, the overhead wires, they come down, it's going to com be complete havoc. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, yes, Sandrum. I appreciate it. I'm going to call up uh, a government witness for the Office of Campaign Finance, the Director uh, Cecilia Collier Montgomery, if you can come forward. And while you're stepping forward, I'll just say that the mission of the Office of Campaign Finance is to regulate and provide public disclosure of the conduct, activities, and financial operations of candidates, campaign finance committees, legal defense committees, and constituent service and statehood fund programs to ensure public trust in the integrity of the election process and government service. The Office is funded by an annual budget allocation, and the FY14 operating budget request is approximately $2.6 million, an increase of approximately 1%. In addition, the office is not requesting an increase in FTEs and intends to execute its mission in FY14 with 31 FTEs. Uh, before we get going with your testimony, Director, I'll ask uh, if you could, if you each could please stand and raise your right hands and be sworn in. Do you each uh, swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, and you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. All right. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie and members of the Committee on Government Operations. I am Cecily E. Collier Montgomery, Director of the Office of Campaign Finance. Seated with me today is William O. Sanford, the General Counsel for the Office of Campaign Finance, as well as Mr. James Hurley, who is our Financial Manager. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the fiscal year 2014 proposed budget requests. The Office of Campaign Finance, as you know, is established within the District of Columbia Board of Elections. The office is responsible for the administrative operations of the board pertaining to the campaign finance laws of the District of Columbia. The mission of the office is to enhance the confidence of the residents of the District of Columbia in the integrity of the election process and government service by monitoring, aiding through education, and enforcing compliance with the campaign finance laws. This goal is accomplished by the Office of the Director and the three divisions of the Office of Campaign Finance, namely the Public Information and Records Management Division, the Reports Analysis and Audit Division, and the Office of the General Counsel. The agency processes and maintains financial records for public inspection, compiles and publishes information for public disclosure, reviews and verifies the accuracy of financial reports by deaths, random, investigative, and full field audits, investigates complaints and conducts informal hearings pertaining to alleged violations of the campaign finance laws and issues interpretive opinion. The programs of the Office of Campaign Finance cannot be prioritized or viewed in a vacuum because our programs are interrelated and act in concert to achieve our mission. 
the proposed fiscal year 2014 gross budget for the agency totals $2,628,515 and 31 full-time equivalents. This represents an increase of 1.1% or a change of $27,470 from the fiscal year 2013 approved local funds budget of $2,601,045. Overall, the proposed budget allocates $2,530,000 for personal services and $98,000 for non-personal services. Object Class 20, supplies and materials, $25,000, and Object Class 40, other services and charges, $73,000. In each budget cycle, funding requests for contractual services and personal services remain critical to the continued success of the programs of the agency. First, as you are aware, the director is authorized to provide for the electronic filing of campaign finance reports. Beginning each fiscal year since 2001, additional funds have been allocated to contractual services for the development, upgrade, and maintenance of the OCF electronic filing and report system. The electronic filing system was first made available to all reporting entities in fiscal year 2003. The system facilitates the online filing of financial reports at the website and provides the public with immediate access to these reports through electronic disclosure. The OCF website serves as the main interface for the filer and the public with the electronic filing and report system. The imaging component of the system facilitates public access to financial reports through the imaging of the reports onto the website. The continued funding of the electronic filing project has ensured the orderly progression of the project to fruition through needed upgrades and the annual maintenance of the system. The fiscal year 2014 budget request of 73000 for object class 40, other services and charges, will not guarantee our ability to continue to maintain and secure upgrades for the system. The agency must recognize the numerous legislative proposals for the reform of campaign finance laws, which, if enacted, will require the modification of the electronic system to fully implement the new disclosure provisions. The vendor who developed the electronic system and who has been responsible for its annual maintenance and upgrades projects the cost of the OCF e-filing system enhancements and maintenance for fiscal year 2014 and the total sum of $85,090.93. The proposed funding for Object Class 40 must support, in addition to the upgrades, the procurement of court transcription services for the OCF investigative hearings at $6,000, copier maintenance at $4,000, specialized training for staff at $8,000, and specialized tools critical to the performance of more robust audits, $1,522. The total estimated cost of $104,613 for these services exceed the proposed funding by approximately $31,613. Notwithstanding, if the campaign finance reform legislation is enacted in this fiscal year, the current approved budget for the agency will support the upgrades. Second, the fiscal year 2014 proposed FTE level of 31 positions continues the OCF staffing level at the fiscal year 2013 actual level. This will enable the Office of Campaign Finance to once again meet the requirements of a workload that seems to change and grow with each election cycle. We submit that the continued investment of funds in personal services is essential to advance the success and quality of the services provided by the agency and will yield in the long run a higher level of performance in all the OCF programs. From a performance standpoint during fiscal year 2014, the agency will monitor the campaign activities of candidates and political committees participating in the April 2014 primary election. 
Agency activities and projects in fiscal year 2014 will center on this selection. Consisting with our ongoing statutory responsibilities, the agency will monitor the constituent services and statehood fund programs. The agency remains committed to increasing service delivery to its constituents in fiscal year 2014 through the continued monitoring and evaluation of key technological advancements, including the upgrades which have been undertaken in this fiscal year for the development of modules to facilitate the administrative registration and the electronic filing and real-time disclosure of the financial reports of the exploratory inaugural transition and legal defense committees. Of significance, the OCF will focus on the ability of its website to deliver campaign finance information in the most accessible formats, including the actual images of financial reports for public disclosure and the reported financial data from the filings through the database download, the various search features, the geographical information system, and the production of summaries and statistical graphs. The website, which was designed in 2003, pursuant to then existing web design standards provided by the Office of the Chief Technology Officer, is in desperate need of a facelift. The OCF online survey, launched on October the 4th, 2012, will aid in this assessment. The survey was designed to elicit comments from which to determine whether the website, its services and features make it easy for users to, one, understand campaign finance requirements, two, file campaign finance reports, and three, access campaign finance records filed with the OCF. The survey closed on January 15, 2013, and 70 visitors to the website participated in the survey. On April the 12th, 2013, the Website Usability Survey Analysis Report prepared by DataNet Systems Corporation was submitted to OCF for consideration. The survey results found that overall most respondents were satisfied with the OCF homepage and the information and services provided through the site. However, the results showed that some users experienced difficulties navigating the site and locating the services they needed and that there were issues involving browser compatibility with the browsers Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox. Based on these findings, it was recommended that the home page layout be redesigned to be less cluttered and more user friendly, that browser compatibility be improved, and that the OCF website navigation scheme be redesigned and incorporate a smart search function on the home page. The survey results are presently under review by the OCF management team in an effort to identify the upgrades and home page design necessary to simplify and improve the public's access to the disclosure data available at the website. In addition, during fiscal year 2014, the OCF will evaluate the effectiveness of the units created in fiscal year 2013 to perform specific functions within the Office of the General Counsel and the Reports Analysis and Audit Division and to better meet the demands of monitoring more complex campaign operation. The realignment was based on three factors which underscored the need to supplement OCF's auditing and enforcement capabilities. First, the fiscal year 2013 OCF budget allocates increases in the personal services budget for the purpose of funding 15 additional continuing full-time positions in the audit and legal divisions. Second, the duty and responsibilities of the agency changed under the Ethics Reform Amendment Act of 2011. Third, since 2002, there have been dramatic increases in the number of election complaints received by the office, the complexity of the funding mechanisms used to support campaigns, and in the total sum of reported receipts and expenditures. As of this date, the Office of Campaign Finance has recruited and filled 11 of the new positions funded in the fiscal year 2013 approved budget. Once fully staffed, the agency will establish standard operating procedures during July 2013 to formalize the practice of the OCF to conduct 
site visits of the early voting centers and election precincts operated by the Board of Election. The procedures will also authorize the site visit to the business offices of candidates for a local elective office and political committees, as well as the offices of any other committees under the purview of the OCF. The procedures will enable the OCF to be proactive in ensuring voluntary compliance with the campaign finance laws through the observation of activity in and around early voting centers and election precincts and of the financial operations and activity of the offices of the various entities registered with the agency. Moreover, the site visits will afford the public the opportunity to ask questions concerning their obligations under the campaign finance laws. During fiscal year 2014, it is our intent to dispatch 10, 6 audit and 4 legal positions, employees to conduct site visits to election precincts during the April 2014 primary. The employees will visit a minimum of 10 precincts located in each of the eight wards on Election Day. The agency will also dispatch a minimum of four employees, two legal and two audit positions, to conduct site visits of the campaign offices of candidates and principal campaign committees during the 2014 election cycle. Lastly, in light of the vast changes to the campaign finance laws, the agency will focus on its educational program and how best to revamp the program to reach a wider audience and strengthen the public's understanding of the changing campaign finance laws. To accomplish this goal, the agency will recruit in fiscal year 2013 a campaign finance training coordinator to manage the OCF educational program. The responsibilities of the position will include the development of a comprehensive educational program which will convey the basics necessary to achieve voluntary compliance with the reporting requirements and the design of online training tools. The agency will continue to offer biweekly educational seminars and special sessions upon request which address the reporting requirements and foster the use of the electronic filing system. On behalf of the Board of Elections, I must also state that in an effort to better serve the public, the long-term goal of the Board is to house both the Office of Campaign Finance and the Board of Elections in one location. The Board and the OCF have been working closely with the Department of General Service, Services to develop projected cost estimates based on the space needs of both agencies. Once received, the cost estimates will be forwarded to the committee for consideration. In conclusion, the fiscal year 2014 performance plan directs the major efforts of the agency in unison to achieve voluntary compliance with the reporting requirements of the campaign finance laws and to provide full public disclosure through the, the delivery of public information in a timely and useful manner. For the most part, the fiscal year 2014 plan continues as well as evaluates the projects initiated and completed during the most recent fiscal years. This completes my testimony. I will be pleased to entertain any questions the committee may have. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Collier Montgomery. And I do have a few questions. I want to begin. <coughs> Uh, by asking you a question about um, sort of the ratio between your personal services budget and your non-personal services budget. Mm -hmm. uh, just that, that your office stands out among some of the other agencies within the uh, purview of the committee mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the, the ratio. And I believe uh, your NPS budget uh, only represents about 4% 4 uh, 4 of your overall budget. And just in general, I know you talked about um, some of the things that that, that MPS represents, but um, mm -hmm. you have any, any insights as to why the ratio is, is such that it is with your agency and it's just so different from some of the other agencies in government? Okay. And I believe that my financial manager can address that question. Well, I'll, I'll uh, indicate in general that um, oftentimes uh, across the last few years, particularly during uh, the recession and the impacts of that, the uh, agencies are, are working towards a target and uh, in a number of cases because of uh, built-in 
PS personal services increases associated with uh, basically step increases or because of an increase in fringe benefit. There are times in which uh, that requires the agency to squeeze, if you will, the NPS budget in order to achieve the uh, desired target. And uh, each agency has, uh, you know, dealt with that challenge uh, often very effectively in terms of looking at alternative ways of achieving their, their mission within a smaller budget, but that has in some cases reduced the NPS portion of the buz budget across time. Because it, it seems to be about a, a almost a 40 percent decrease in NPS for proposed uh, FY14 compared to FY13. And that's even in line. I know that in FY13 you all got a, a, a additional staff uh, money funds for additional FTEs in FY13. Perhaps mm -hmm. that's what represents the large increase. Um, but but I don't want to speak for you. I'm just sort of wondering how it fluctuated from about 73,012 to 163 and 13, and the proposed 14 is at 98,000. Again, the uh, drop to 98, I think, uh, again, was uh, largely driven by an effort to try to uh, achieve a, a budget target. And uh, without reducing staffing, uh, a lot of times the squeeze is in the area of NPS. And I think that's the reason for the reduction that you're seeing in, in FY14. Uh, and, and I'm just trying to reconcile that with your testimony where, where you um, uh, carefully laid out some of the costs associated with uh, the filing system enhancements and maintenance and that the total estimated cost of $104,613 for the services exceed the proposed funding by approximately $31,613. Yes, and I would again add, though, however, if the, um, if the, the campaign finance reform legislation is enacted within this fiscal year, the OCF budget for fiscal year 13 can support uh, the upgrades which would be required by the legislation. And if that is the case, the estimate the estimate actually for the uh, upgrades, I believe, totals um, 40 some thousand, and then 30 some thousand of the total eight, 80 some thousand dollar figure uh, is attributable to maintenance costs for next year. So if we are, in fact, able to uh, proceed with the upgrades that are required by the campaign finance reform uh, legislation in this fiscal year, then the 73,000 which is um, proposed for uh, non-personal services the in object class 40 would be sufficient to support maintenance, maintenance costs for the uh, system during fiscal year 14. And with respect to personal services, in the approved FY13 budget, in your agency's FY12 FTE approved total was 16 FTEs. Yes. Uh, however, in your submitted FY14 budget proposal, it states that the FY12 approved FTE total was actually 15.3 FTEs. And I'm just hoping you might be able to um, reconcile uh, the discrepancies there. Uh, let me just mention that the uh, FY12 number, the 15.3, is uh, that column typically is the actual. And so to the extent that you have uh, part-time or positions that are not filled for the uh, complete year, it can, uh, in computing actual, depending on number of hours a person is in a position, you can end up in that column labeled FY12 as showing a fraction. And I think that's what happened in this case. Okay. And so the, the accurate number is, is, is 15.3 FTEs for 12. Yes, that's correct. Okay. We were at the agency was given, um, was provided funding for um, 16, 15 additional 
uh, FTEs in the fiscal year 2013 budget. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, with respect to that, uh, from FY12 to FY13, the office increased its FTE count by over 90 percent. Uh, nearly doubling the amount of FTEs in the agency. Uh, however, according to the Schedule A that the committee received, there's still 12 vacancies within OCF. And well, of the approximate 15 additional FTEs approved for FY13 budget, nearly 80 percent of that total is still unfilled going into the third quarter of our fiscal year. As of this date, the agency currently has 19 positions filled. We had, um, during the last two months, advertised eight positions, eight additional positions. Six of those positions, selections were made, and the applicants, uh, the candidates accepted uh, the employment office offer to decline. We um, basically, at this point, have six vacancies remaining. Um, Four of the positions are of the original um, uh, 15 positions which were funded uh, in the, the new positions which were funded in the fiscal year 13 budget. And four of those positions, those are audit positions. We have filled all five of the legal positions and we have filled uh, approximately uh, six audit positions. The new positions, with the new positions, we have filled the six positions. We have two employees who are scheduled, I believe, to come on, who are scheduled to report for duty on May the 6th, and the remaining four employees are scheduled to report on May the 20th. As I discussed pre previously, we are having a space um, revised or renovated on the third floor of the Reeves Center to accompany the increased staffing levels uh, for the Office of Campaign Finance. And it is anticipated that we will house nine employees in that space. We are in the process of preparing to recruit for the remaining vacant positions in the agency. So for the six, and just so I'm clear, there's six uh, vacant FTEs to date? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and then four of those are audit positions that were a part of the 15 additional FTEs that were provided for in the FY13 budget. Yes. And then what are the final two? The final two positions were vacancies which were created as a result of employees being promoted uh, to the new positions. Okay, and which positions are those? Do you know what those are? Those were audit positions. One was the supervisory auditor uh, position at the MS-12 level, which was filled in January, uh, January the 14th, 2013, to be exact. The other position, uh, the employee who was selected for that position uh, was selected in an auditor position at a CS-11, and that position was filled on January the 14th, 2013. Also, I had one legal position uh, where on a, on a former employee applied for the position and was selected, and that was the new position, Attorney Advisor LS, LS12, and that position was actually filled on January the 14th, 2013. Okay. so so. To date, there's six FTE vacancies, and all of them are for audit positions. Four are for audit positions. One is a vacant legal position. Uh, it actually is a position that was classified as the LS-11 uh, level, and we are having it reclassified uh, as a CS-11 hearing officer position. And then the other position is an audit position. Okay. And since there uh, will be uh, an apparent cost savings of not having uh, paid salaries or fringe for those positions that are vacant for half the year, uh, and since the, the potential amount of the savings will be less than the amount that, that requires council approval, do you have uh, any idea at this point how you might use those savings? Well. It's my intent that with the savings that we 
that are resulting as a result of the salary lapses that we would be able to uh, reprogram some of those funds to implement uh, the recommendations which have been made as a result of the uh, website survey. One being the redesign of the uh, website homepage as well as the uh, improved uh, cross-browser uh, compatibility and also to improve the navigation scheme of the website. Uh, again, in the event that the campaign finance reform legislation is enacted in this fiscal year, then we would also be able to support um, the implementation of that legislation through the uh, funds in this fiscal year as well, through the use of those funds. And uh, of note, this year there's an allocation within your FY14 budget for regular play uh, dash other. Uh, can you explain this increase uh, from zero in FY13? I believe that's just a matter of uh, classifying. I believe one of the positions as a, a term uh, appointment, I believe, is the reason why the uh, funding was shown in uh, regular pay other, the 59000 so the staffing is the same. It's just a matter of the designation of a particular position. Okay. And, and why would that position be designated as term as compared to, I imagine it was a. As term. Whether that was the attorney advisor or one of them. It was previously designated as term. It's a career position. Which one was that? It must be one of position. Um. I'm trying to you can, determine you can, which position that is. You can always get back to the committee if it's something that requires a little additional time. I'm just sort of curious okay. as to what that might represent. Okay. We can uh, provide the feedback. Okay. It's one of the positions. We'll uh, clarify which one it is, but it's uh, because it's designated as a as a term position. It's uh, pay is a, is in that category. Okay. This position Thank was all type revenue. That's why it's when Thompson has to put it. It could be that this was formerly a, was this, a, this may be one of the positions which was formally identified with the uh, special fund, the, the position was paid from the special um, purposes fund during fiscal year 12. Yeah. The, uh, yes. The revenues which were captured from the lobbyist registration fees. Okay. With the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability continuing to become operational and increase staff, uh, what roles and responsibilities that were once under OCF's purview will now be under uh, the purview of uh, the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability? That would be the responsibility for uh, receiving and monitoring the financial disclosure statements of public officials as well as the lobbying activity reports from lobbyists, the registration as well as the activity reports of lobbyists. And the responsibility for uh, administering the provisions of the code which pertain to the conflict of interest statute. And how many FTEs did you have assigned to those tasks, uh, and how much of their time was devoted to that work? Uh, with the, uh, the responsibility for the financial disclosure statements, um, basically the review of the financial disclosure statements was the responsibility of the audit branch initially. The audit branch would refer uh, any of the statements which required further review to the Office of the General Counsel. So the General Counsel assumed responsibility for the financial disclosure statements as well. With respect 
to complaints that we received or complaints that we initiated in which there were allegations of uh, violations of the conflict of interest statutes that those uh, complaints were investigated by the uh, general counsel's office as well. Uh, with the lobbyist reports, the uh, audit branch performed the review of the lobbyist reports as well as uh, performed periodic random audits of the lobbyist activity reports. Uh, any investigations pertaining to allegations of violations of the lobbying statute, those were investigated by the Office of the General Counsel. At, during the time during which we had uh, responsibility for the lobbying statutes as well as the financial disclosure and the conflict of interest statutes, we had four uh, full-time employees uh, in the audit branch and we had, I believe, three full-time employees in the office of the general counsel. So they assumed those responsibilities in addition to the other statutory responsibilities of the office, which would be the responsibility for administering and, and enforcing um, the um, the laws pertaining to the, con the constituent service uh, program as well as the campaign finance laws. So, and, and I appreciate that that's helpful. Um, I, I asked that question because I'm, I'm uh, contemplating uh, the hearing we're going to have uh, mm -hmm. in a little while with the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability mm -hmm. and knowing that they've assumed some of the duties and responsibilities once uh, held by your office, uh, and I believe that they say they're they're in, in in being responsible for the financial disclosure statements that your office had. I believe around three FTEs uh, handling that work, but it sounds like those FTEs who handled that work weren't handling solely financial disclosure statements full time. That they had a host of other duties that they handled as well. That's correct. And I would also point out, I neglected to include the fact that we also was responsible for receiving the reports through the electronic filing system as well, as well as, uh, you know, scheduling hearings on the failures to file. Uh, we also, uh, with respect to those reports, um, we administer um, a pre-notification program and the failure to file uh, program as well. Also, the uh, the laws, of course, have changed in terms of the um, the responsibility or the uh, public officials who were designated as filers. Under the old financial disclosure statute, it would have been all of the um, district government employees who fell at a certain level, and, and I think believe that was defined as a DS-13 or above, in the management supervisory service as well as in the accepted service and the legal service. Uh, as well as all of the members of the boards and commissions, um, the uh, statutorily named boards and commissions, as well as those who performed uh, certain responsibilities in certain areas. So the coverage under the financial disclosure statute has changed from that which was under uh, the jurisdiction of the Office of Campaign Finance. Under the present law, the employees are employees who are fall within the accepted uh, service and perform other responsibilities, as well as certain members of boards and commissions. Okay, thank you. And uh, under agency management, uh, you have three support services groups: public information and record management, report analysis, and audit division and Office of the General Counsel. Uh, of the three, only 18 percent of your agency management spending is spent on public information and record management. Mm -hmm. And with uh, the ever-increasing scrutiny of campaign finance records and disclosures of our elections, uh, do you feel this is enough funding to make sure that the public has adequate access to these vital records? I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? Sure. I, I just identified uh, those three support services groups under agency management, uh, and it's public information, the record management is one, 
report analysis and audit division is the second, and Office of General Counsel is the third. Yes. And uh, of those three, only 18 percent of your agency management spending is spent on public information and record management. And so I wanted to know, uh, you know, given uh, the increasing scrutiny on campaign finance records and disclosures, whether or not you thought that was enough funding uh, to make sure the public has adequate access to the records. Yeah, I, the, the funding is adequate. The, also, the electronic filing system is managed through the Public Information and Record Management Division as well, as well as the uh, website. And, and, and currently, does the law still allow campaigns and other uh, organizations to file physically within the office? Yes. Okay. And so within your, your key performance indicators, you state that your FY13 projection for the percentage of financial reports filed electronically is 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, your FY14 projections are 90 and FY15 projections are 95. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, hoping you can explain how you hope to meet these projections based on the current landscape. Well, with the filing of the reports, um, the, the reason why we're able to make those projections is because uh, with every uh, fiscal year, we have seen a substantial increase uh, in terms of the numbers of reports that are electronically filed, and we saw a significant increase when we provided for the certification functionality. Prior to that, we required that reporting entities file the original with the uh, signature of the uh, treasurer. Uh, and that apparently had an impact on the use of the electronic filing system. But with the introduction of the certification functionality, the reports, the filing of the reports has steadily increased um, through the years. The lowest uh, use of the electronic filing system was with the, the lobbyists. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you, you noted in your testimony that the plans to, to build out uh, at the current location uh, in the Reeves building, uh, and I believe you said it's going to accommodate approximately nine uh, yes. staff members. Uh, what's the time frame on that? And is there any discussion with, with DGS about consolidating your office with uh, is there any continuing discussion, because I know there's been discussion in the past yes. with the Department of General Services about uh, trying to bring your office together with the Board of Elections? Well, um, with respect first to the space on the third floor, um, the uh, Department of General Service, the actual renova renovation of that space was to commence this week. And we have been given a time frame of approximately two weeks for the uh, construction to be finalized. In terms of the move of the Board of Elections and the OCF into one space, the, the first a challenge would be to actually locate a space that would house uh, both of the agencies and also, um, I guess, based on the needs of both of the agencies. So that is the initial challenge. And I believe that uh, the Department of General Services is looking into that. They have not identified any space as of this point. Uh, we have been meeting, you know, they have met with both agencies to look at our spaces and also to discuss our staffing levels as well as what the uh, individual needs of both agencies would be. Okay. Uh, and they were supposed to um, provide us with estimated cost for such a move. I do not have any additional questions uh, at this time. Is there anything that you would like to add to the record uh, before we wrap up the hearing? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your testimony, uh, Director, and, and thank you for the uh, testimony of your staff. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.
And next we're going to hear from public witnesses with respect to the Office of the Inspector General. The mission of the Office of the Inspector General Again, the mission of the Office of the Inspector General is to conduct independent financial and performance audits, inspections, and investigations of the district government operations to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. These investigations and audits not only ferret out mismanagement, but encourage the District of Columbia government to be more efficient and effective. The OIG is divided into three programs, agency management, accountability, control, and compliance, and law enforcement and compliance. The agency management program provides administrative support for the agency. The accountability, control, and compliance program conducts audits and inspections of the district government and its finances. And finally, the law enforcement and compliance program conducts investigations of allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse relating to the operations of the district government. The law enforcement and compliance program includes a Medicaid fraud investigation unit that is partially federally funded. To ensure the OIG's independence, district law mandates that the Inspector General be appointed for a six-year term without regard to party affiliation and that the IG can be removed from office only for cause. The Inspector General's proposed FY 2014 gross budget is $15,947,792, which represents a 1.7 percent increase over its fiscal year 2013 approved gross budget. With that, uh, I'll ask to hear first from our public witnesses and signed up to testify on the Office of the Inspector General are Michael Syndrome and Geraldine Talley Hobby. If there are any other public witnesses who'd like to testify with respect to the Office of the Inspector General, please come forward at this time. And we'll begin with uh, you since you're seated already, Mr. Syndrome. Thank you. Good morning, Stu. Say it again, Mr. Chair. I said good morning. You may oh. begin. Good morning again, Mr. Chair. All those with the sound of my voice. Michael Syndrome, disabled veteran, served our country more than most. Wanted to bring to your attention again the examiner, which does splendid investigative reporting, closing up shop mid June. Saddens my heart. Maybe it'd be nice if the council could um, could do something about that. Preferred Amendment One. Congress Council shall make no law abridging freedom of the press. Eh? Not saying that you're responsible, the council, but it'd be nice to keep them up and running. You know, as I um, have been to many many hearings, the thought struck me. I'm sure you're aware of the adage that haste makes waste, and we take. Uh, Entity after entity, back to back. Is that prudent? You know, I know we all have a full plate and a lot going on, but um, be good to, you know, to step back a moment, Mr. Chair, and, and think about how the public weighs in on these matters. I'm one of the few faces, you know, that comes forward, and when we do this, uh, you know, in a very limited uh, period of time. With respect to uh, Inspector General, and I had uh, some tender moments of bonding uh, with Inspector General Willoughby, it's been a, a, um, an issue about when a complaint is filed and how to be kept in the loop, if you will. I've made a suggestion, and I'll renew it again, to have a letter of acknowledgment with an assigned case number and assigned investigator. Um, and Inspector General Willoughby counters, well, you can phone in on the hotline, you can email, and I happen to be cybernetically challenged, and there's a number of us who are, so that's not a viable option, or you can walk in, to which I reminded the uh, good Inspector General, I don't live around the corner, but I uh, offered, how about doing an in-house visit, eh? That would be uh, a good idea. That would be win-win. could meet face-to-face -face with the constituency, right? And we know full well, Mr. Chair, you can't cross-examine a piece of paper and open the door to some hospitality. I didn't say hostility. And to get, uh, you know, to get in the community a little bit better, uh, Mr. Inspector General, instead of coming to a drab office usually that doesn't have any kind of sunlight and the circulation, air, air circulation is not all that good, it would be good to get on the field and see what's going on. So the, the letter of acknowledgment, you know, again, naming 
case number, sign investigator, would be helpful and to be kept in the loop. They want to conclude, again with the examiner, a timely article, how influence peddlers evade ethics law. If you want to get rid of the alligators for good, you need to start by draining the swamp. Let me repeat that, Mr. Chair. If you want to get rid of the alligators for good, you need to start by draining the swamp. And I would dare say with the trolley folly of $400 million in counting since we're a budget and whatnot, that swamp is far from being drained. The, the culture of corruption alive and well. Any questions, I'd be delighted to field them at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Syndrome. Uh, Ms. Tally Hobby. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Chair McDuffie and committee members in their absence. To God be the glory and God I trust. My, um, uh, Jesus is Lord. I am Geraldine Tally Hobby, a DC PS injured art teacher, and I'm speaking for the DC Injured Workers Committee, Civil Service Status, Employees Federal DC, Janice Dunbar, Charlene Morgan, Cheryl Board, John Fenwick Jr., Thelma Moore, and those deceased, Don Saunders, Geraldine Adams, and Sandra Mitchell, are my friends. Uh, injured employees, uh, as injured employees, we we uh, will give our information again to um, to the, the IG and also to you to review so some action can be taken. We met with a representative from the IG's office on more than one occasion as well as with the DC Auditor's Office. We also went to the IG's office with our individual complaints which should have uh, been moved forward to the U.S. Uh, D.C. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, complaints range from a series of personal, personal issues as well as overall issues. The D.C. Uh, City Auditor's Office and the D.C. Uh, IG's Office did perform two audits, at least uh, uh, the City Administrator one and then the IG's Office two through, through the years of the Office of Risk Management, but not on uh, the third party administrator or the subsequently the employees compensation fund was not audited which would reflect the following uh, each physical year. Injured workers uh, claims hired on or before September 30th, 1987. Injured claim is hired on or after October 1st, 1987. Uh, Claim benefits reduced with reasons, claims uh, benefits suspended with reasons, and claimants benefits terminated with reasons. And with statistical data uh, t uh, is essential to tracking employees as well as projecting the budget. This fund, renamed Disability Compensation Fund, needs to be audited historically. Um, permanent injury claims should be identified in addition to temporary total long term which becomes permanent as well as temporary total permanent partial. There needs to be a full audit of the public sector workers compensation uh, fund along with ORM, the TPAs, uh, employee agencies, um, Department of Employment Services, etc. Issues, I'll move on. Uh, there are some um, public fraud, public waste, and public corruption involved. The issues are as follows, uh, under the, f and, and issues are f as follows. And then I have a question, questions attached as well. Full investigation, substantial competent evidence reviewed, administrative procedures adhered to, original DC code adhered, adhered to of, of uh, CPA uh, 21 dash. 139-1978, and uh, recognition of employees hired uh, before September 30th, uh, in 1987, right of review, right of appeal, access to proper ju jurisdiction, permanent employment, reinstatement of employment, uh, tenure, property rights, state, uh, stakeholders' rights, uh, uh, seniority rights, civil service retirement rights, recognition of teachers of benefits earned on or before June 30th, 1997 as federal, and those by, with district June 30th, 1997. Access to federal courts uh, for D.C. injured workers hired uh, prior to the Home Rule Act, access to district courts for employees hired under the district. Uh, recognition of civil service workers' compensation disability under the U.S. Department of Labor. Recognition of permanent workers' comp um, is an issue. Overall, Social Security benefits for the same injury. Uh, not being 
lured into administrative hearings, uh, federal claims, and also uh, if lured there, having a full evidentiary hearing of the whole case file, record not a portion thereof. Evidence altered, omitted, concealed. D.C. City Attorneys and Hearing Examiners, later Administrative Law Judges, not D.C. Barred, not being lured into the wrong jurisdiction, D.C. Superior Court, D.C. Court of Appeals, and, and but rather the U.S. District Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals. Freedom from fraud and corruption, malicious, willful intent, um, negligent actions, wanton and gross action, intentional and willful actions, incompetence, abuse of authority, uh, and what we demand is our quality of life restored, equal justice of the law, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, prevention of obstruction of justice, adherence to due process of law, uh, full audits of the above, appropriate action by IG, prevention of obstruction of justice, and restoration of our American dream from our nightmares. Ms. Tally Hobby, if you could uh, conclude it. Oh, we're well, great. It's perfect. <laughs> Time and it's only. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to read uh, the other part about about a, a workers' comp because I've given well, you that. If you want, you can make sure you provide the committee. That with sums the it up. But the huh? cop, if you'd like, you can provide the committee with the, a copy of your testimony if you haven't already done so. I have. So I, I have. That into the record. Okay. And, and Mr. Sinjam, I, I just only have one question for you all. Um, you made mention uh, about the, the IG's office sort of getting out into the community. Uh, and he's going to come up here next, and so I'll ask him. But w what's been his response to that? I know sometimes it is helpful for agencies to when just... I, when I broached the issue and brought it to the forefront many moons ago, a, a letter, Kurt letter, was initially sent out. Thereafter, it's died and fallen on tin ears. So that needs to be resurrected, if you will, and put in place as standard operational procedure. Again, when an individual files a complaint and... You know, they may do it through the tipster line anonymity, but I have sought fit to come in face to face. You can't cross examine a piece of paper. And the intake uh, individual may have follow up questions, may, um, you know, may want additional information, which is why I'm there. But thereafter, it kind of, you know, dies because when I want to follow up, I've got no uh, assigned case that I can refer back to. I've got no point of contact, basically. Again, uh, Inspector General Willoughby says, well, you can, you can phone in and we can provide this. You know, time is precious. I, um, I, I don't uh, punch a time clock and, you know, take up space. My time is extremely limited. And I'd like to expedite and streamline some, some of this stuff. So that would be helpful across the board. But, but to, to, you know, in, in sort of in, the, in, the, in their defense, you yeah. also mentioned how the office is, is sort of off the beaten path. Uh, not a lot of windows, um, but I imagine, you know, given the sensitive nature of the and the mission associated with the Office of Inspector General, if there were uh, someone who wanted to file a complaint, perhaps they don't want to see as many people uh, 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 being able to see them go inside the office and file the complaint. Perhaps they, they'd like to be, um, uh, to do so in a way that, that sort of, preserves their confidence and, 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 and sort of doesn't get out to the general public. Perhaps there's some logic behind the location. You know, it's interesting you should make mention of that, Mr. Chair, because in the same building at 717 4th Street Northwest, the IG um, assumes occupancy of a number of floors. In that same building on the ninth floor is a DC auditor. And just recently, there were laptops stolen and whatnot. So if we're looking from a vantage of security, I don't see how that carries the day. I understand, you know, there are things of a confidential privilege nature taking place, but not unlike here, let the sun shine in. Well, right? I, I'll tell you, I, I don't know when the, 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 when there were any laptops or anything stolen or wh whether or not. Matter of public record in the news. Well, what I'm, I'm surprised you is, haven't heard about it. What I'm saying is I actually visited the Office of the Inspector General a few weeks ago and noted um, um, the the security uh, that was available in the building, and I believe that there were just some enhancements made in terms of the front desk as well recently. So, um, but I, I don't want to belabor the point. I'll let the the IG speak. Yeah, unless I was the there on, on the second or third floor, they have a candidate monitoring. The, it's a locked door. You have to ring the bell, be acknowledged. You have to be permitted to have access. This is just the gateway, you know, to initially make a complaint known. 
Uh, and I think Inspector General Willoughby is on another floor, and there are several floors occupied by IG. But my point is to make it more user-friendly, accessible, get this letter of uh, acknowledgement, get a signed case number, and a point of contact. You know, as I heard Ms. Tavi speak, you may be aware that uh, today, I believe it's President Eisenhower put on a currency as a matter of law, our Congress has, uh, in God we trust. And I was thinking, and I hope, trust and pray, you read scripture. In Luke 18, it talks about the unjust judge and the widow. It indicates the judge who neither feared God nor respected man, but because the widow continually came before this judge, he said, she's going to wear me out. I've got to give her her props, you know, what to do her. And it's time that we who come forward to you time and time again to closely and carefully listen to what we're, we're saying. Right? And, and give us some justice. I didn't say just ice. Because in the words of Martin King, when the rights of one are violated, the rights of all are endangered. And don't forget, Mr. Chair, today it's me or Ms. Hobby, whether the case may be, and tomorrow it may very well be you. And Martin King also said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So listen carefully, and your colleagues too. Uh, you know, to what we're coming forward. It's a hassle coming down here. It's a hassle in terms of taking off from work, in terms of parking, in terms of time, in terms of oftentimes dealing with immature staffers. I'm saying your committee is one of the better, if not the best ones. And, and oftentimes your colleagues are very abusive and disrespectful. And uh, if they don't like what I have to say and my right to say it, call security, arrest him, and on, that ought not be. That ought not be. It's a, it's a chilling effect, a muzzling effect on we the people. Unless we forget we're the sovereign body, eh? Thank you, Mr. Syndrome, and thank you, Ms. Tally Harvey. Obviously, I don't. Uh, can I say to, one thing, please? Uh, um, sure, go the ahead. policies, procedures, practices, and the process of the law within the IG's office needs to be transparent and clarified because we went in there with our, um, with our complaints, and they were not processed fully to the extent of the law. And they have people who can arrest people there. Uh, the IG's office has that authority. And if he doesn't have enough money to do that, the particular job to investigate these agencies, he needs to get additional money from the district or from the federal government for our protection because we shouldn't have to go through this in as long a duration as we have gone through from mayor, from mayor to mayor to mayor. Let me ask it doesn't you, mean make any sense. Let me ask you specifically. You said that the policies and procedures need to be clarified. What specific policy or procedure? Of that office. But which, uh, the policies, procedures, in general, or? in general, of, of their office to carry out complaints, okay. and like um, Mr. Syndrome said, complaint numbers, because uh, often they don't give you complaint numbers. Sometimes they'll send you something back and they'll black it out because they said you, you, uh, the public is not. Uh, supposed to have that information, but this is public agencies. These are not private agencies. The public should be aware and, and information should be transparent of everything they do in that office because they're, they're the only agencies that we have protection from from uh, these violations within the district, enforcement of the law. It's also an agency that, that at times it's, it is appropriate to redact certain information from public view uh -huh. uh, when they want to protect uh, the identity or information uh, that's part of an, uh, an investigation. So uh -huh. there, there are occasions where that is appropriate to do so. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with the information right. that you received and whether it was appropriate or not, but I just wanted to put it out there okay. that it is appropriate to redact uh, certain information at times. So. The operative word, Mr. Chair, at times on occasion, but this seems to be an ongoing pattern of conduct, as Ms. Hobby points out, to redact information that is not confidential, that is not privileged, and, um, you know, ought not be. As has been said, the art of good governance, accountability, rule of law, and transparency. And we're, we're talking about budget here. If we can pour $400 million into trolley folly in counting, then we should have enough ducats for Inspector General Willoughby and all the rest of the agencies, you know, that, that are in dire, desperate need of adequate funding. That $400 million for the trolley folly is just not going to cut it. And I don't know why it's being pushed, because a couple status quo monarchical elitists are being unjustly enriched. And as we speak, too, PEPCO, which is greedy, I didn't say needy, undergrounding on our dime, extremely expensive, and on and on and on. Okay. Again, where, where you sit depends on where you stand. And you can bring, you know, the, the integrity of the council. And, and the chair says it's tarnished. No, it's obliterated. Okay? Well, thank you, Mr. Syndrome, and thank you, Ms. Tali Hobby, for thank your you. testimony. I don't have any additional questions at this time.
Next, we're going to hear from a uh, government witness for the Office of the Inspector General. Uh, that is Inspector General Charles Willoughby. And if you could please, uh, both of you, remain standing and raise your right hands before you be seated. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please uh, be seated. You can begin, uh, Mr. Inspector General, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Chairperson McDuffie and members of the committee. I am Charles J. Willoughby, Inspector General, and I am pleased to testify today concerning the proposed fiscal year 2014 budget request for the Office of the Inspector General. With me today to assist in the presentation of the budget request is Renee Phillips, our budget officer. The mission of the Office of the Inspector General is to conduct independent audits, investigations, and inspections to detect and prevent fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement, and to help the District of Columbia government improve its programs and operations by promoting economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. Our total requested operating budget for fiscal year 2014, which would support 112 FTEs, is $15.9 million. When compared to our fiscal year 2013 approved gross operating budget of $15.7 million, $15 million, this represents an increase of $156,000 within the local budget, which is a 1.2 percent growth and an increase of $106,000 in the federal budget. The gross budget amount of $15.9 million is comprised of $13.4 million in local funds and $2.5 million in federal grant funds, an overall increase of $262,000. The grant fund supports 17 FTEs, or 75 percent of the cost associated with the operation of the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit, or MAFUKU, within the office. The local budget supports 95 FTEs, as well as the cost of contracting for the district's comprehensive annual financial report, or CAFRA. The cost of the CAFRA next year is budgeted at $2.9 million. The Office of the Inspector General is a performance-based budget agency that allocates funding for the following specific programs. <coughs> The Accountability, Control, and Compliance Program will have a funded budget of $7.7 .7 million, an increase of $84,000 over the fiscal year 2013 approved budget of $7.6 million. <coughs> the increase of $80,000 in personal services covers within grade increases and fringe benefits adjustments. Non-personal services increased by less than 1 percent or $4,000 due to the rate of inflation. The budget supports 45 FTEs. The law enforcement program will have a funded budget of $6 million. This program is comprised of $3.5 million in local funds, which is an increase of $3,000 over the fiscal year 2013 approved local fund budget. Increases to the local fund budget consist of $3,000 in non-personal services due to the rate of inflation. This program also includes $2.5 million in federal grant funds to support the Mafuku. Federal funds were increased by $106,000 over the fiscal year 2013 approved budget. This increase included $86,191 in personal services to support $53,397 for a cost of living adjustment with in-grade increases of $15,105 and, and $17,689 to support the fringe benefit adjustment. It also included an increase of $19,809 in non-personal services due to the rate of inflation. The gross budget for this program supports 50 FTEs. The Agency Management Program will have a funded budget of $2.2 million, which is an increase of $69,000 over the fiscal year 2013 approved budget of $2.1 million for this program. The increase of $18,000 in personal services covers within grade increases and fringe benefit adjustments. 
non-personal services increased by $51,000 to cover the cost of centralizing online research through LexisNexis and procuring computer software licenses. This budget supports 17 FTEs. A brief analysis of the OIG budget reveals that several million dollars of our funding is designated for mandated activities. Functions required by law include the following. The CAFR, Audit of the Highway Trust Fund, Audit of Procurement and Contract Administration, Audit of the Home Purchase Assistance Fund, Audit of the Highway Trust Fund five-year forecast, Audit of the West End Library and Fire Station Maintenance Fund, Audit of Special Education Attorney Certifications, Audit of the Office of Tax and Revenue for purposes of examining the district's management and valuation of commercial real property assessments, maintenance of a live complaint hotline, referral of criminal allegations to the U.S. Attorney's Office for possible prosecution and conducting investigations as necessary, and fraud and abuse investigations and prosecutions re regarding or related to the district's Medicaid program. Over the most recent budget cycles, the OIG has shared in citywide cuts that reduced its operational funding in the proposed budget. Our budget recognized the need to acquire, train, and retain a competent and competitive professional staff. Cuts in funding and personnel could impact the accomplishing of both planned work and emerging work requested by district agencies' directors, council members, the executive, and other stakeholders. A major portion of the OIG budget is consumed by responsibilities mandated by statute, and our results in these areas increase each year. In fiscal year 2012, cases in our investigations division resulted in 12 arrests, one indictment, 10 convictions, 23 sentences, and the issuance of 144 subpoenas. In addition, OIG investigations resulted in more than $836,545 in restitution orders and recoveries. Further, the OIG Investigations Division issued seven reports of investigation containing a total of 37 recommendations, four management alert reports, 18 significant activity reports, and 157 investigative referrals. The OIG Investigations Division also continues its referral program, which resulted in 485 referrals to other government agencies. Finally, the OIG Investigations Division conducted regular outreach with other district government employees in the form of corruption prevention lectures. During fiscal year 2012, the Mafuku addressed more than 3,241 reports of possible fraud committed by Medicaid providers and abuse or neglect at nursing and group homes. In addition, the Mafuku obtained five criminal convictions, three involving fraud against the Medicaid program, one for neglect of an elderly person residing in a long-term care facility, and one for sexual abuse of a vulnerable adult. A Mafuku attorney who was detailed to the United States Attorney's Office to work on Medicaid fraud matters was co-counsel on a criminal matter that resulted in a provider's conviction on 35 counts of fraud against the Medicaid program. The Mafuku maintains more than 250 open quitam matters. These cases often result in settlements that return dollars to the Medicaid program. In fiscal year 2012, the Mafuku recouped more than $3.7 million from Quitam cases as restitution to the Medicaid program. Discretionary work conducted under the OIG's compliance program is also significant. For example, the Audit Division has aligned its audit units to address high-risk areas in the district, such as procurement, Medicaid, and education programs. For fiscal year 2012, the Audit Division issued 28 reports with total potential monetary benefits of approximately $75 million. When comparing these potential monetary benefits to audit division costs of approximately $3, $3 million, the, the, the result is a return on investment for audits perform, performed by o, OIG audit staff that approximates $25 for each dollar invested. In light of continuing economic conditions, the audit division agreed to eliminate audit positions yet continues to remain proactive with limited resources. The Inspections and Evaluations Division, or INE, is tasked with conducting inspections and re-inspections of district agencies as well as special evaluations requested by both the Council and the Mayor. 
Since the date of last year's budget hearing, INE has issued 14 reports that presented a total of 55 findings and 104 recommendations aimed at improving district agencies' internal operations and the services they provide. As reflected in our reports, which, are all, which all are encouraged to read thoroughly and which are distributed to the legislative and executive branches to assist them in their over, oversight responsibilities and published on our website for public accessibility, the OIG will continue to strive to promote economy, efficiency, and effectiveness in district programs and operations. The OIG has done and will continue to do this by, among other things, exposing improprieties by employees at all levels, including agency directors, referring matters to appropriate law enforcement entities such as, such as the United States Attorney's Office and the Office of the Attorney General for prosecution, exposing operational deficiencies and encouraging through all the resources at its disposal the adoption of corrective actions. Finally, as I have previously stated and continue to believe, although congressional legislation protects the, legis the Inspector General's budget request as a means of ensuring independent and effective oversight operations, I believe that our performance outputs and other contributions to good governance provide a separate basis to justify our budgetary requirements. This concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Willoughby. And uh, I want to begin my questioning uh, with respect to the uh, Accountability, Control, and Compliance Program. Your fiscal year 2014 budget for the Accountability, Control, and Compliance Program includes an additional $62,000 for audits. And I believe this is on page A-229 of the budget book. How will this uh, increase be utilized? Yeah. Uh, right here. Okay. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Sure. That, uh, this this amount is basically contribute to the um, fringe benefit adjustments, and also uh, we had uh, increases at in MPS about one percent to cover the cost of inflation. So, but the majority of it is for the fringe benefit increase. Okay. And you feel. Right. Uh, do you feel you have sufficient resources uh, currently or as proposed for 2014 to uh, accomplish the uh, audit responsibilities of your office? Yes, I do. As I, as I testified before, it, it, the challenge is to do things in a streamlined fashion. So, so therefore, we realize that. I mean, in, in, in a public entity such as this, it's, it's um, that we have to learn to do as much as we can within our budget. And, and this office will um, continue to perform its mission um, with the funds um, um, that have been um, designated for its fiscal year 2014 budget. I assume this, this, the answer is probably the same for this question, but I'll, I'll ask it for the record nonetheless. Uh, where the mayor's proposed budget uh, also includes a small $22,000 bump for inspections and evaluations in the Accountability Control and Compliance Program. Uh, does this uh, does the OIG have sufficient resources to accomplish its inspections and evaluations missions as well? Yes. Okay. And uh, the OIG's NPS proposed budget for the Accountability Control and Compliance Program is $3.1 million, which is considerably larger than the NPS budgets for OIG's other two programs. Can you discuss what drives the NPS calls for the RG's accountability control and compliance program? Accountability control. Oh, okay. That that includes audits and um, inspections and evaluations. So the audit, uh, the, the cost for that is. Uh, is it associated with 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 the CAFR at all too? No, no this no, is that, just that for the audits for, for the auditors and inspections and evaluations. Okay. And I should, I should point out that, that, that the audit division, for example, we, we, we average anywhere from, I think, two audits a month up to one a week. 
since during my tenure, we've gone from 20-something up to 51, something like that, that during a period. Of right, and we have 45 FTEs that's under that program. What's the budget for the um, uh, for the CAFR in FY14? 2.9 million. Okay, and that's the same as it was in, in FY13, I believe 12 as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, then, and do you all, I mean, is, is it generally uh, some cushion that's available uh, after CAFR is performed and there's some, uh, some, some spending or, or actually uh, an imbalance left after the CAFR is performed? Yeah, well, each year, each subsequent year of the CAFR, the cost should go down, and, but we, we maintain, a, and I'll defer to Ms. Ms. Phillips to correct me if I'm wrong, but we maintain a buffer to cover those exigent circumstances, circumstances that may arise during the, um, the CAFR years. Right, that we may have to do modifications. Exactly. I guess the answer to this question was yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just so uh, the, the record's clear uh, with respect to the CAFR and, and the contract, if you could just talk a little bit about how the contract is structured. It's, it's structured over a five year period. Exactly. The okay. contract is let for a five year period. And with each uh, year, the contract has to be modified. And because it's over a million dollars, it has to go to the council for approval. Okay. And I do believe that the, uh, this year, for 2013, it has already been through the council. Yeah, is, is it, that's correct. You know which year uh, in the contract we're, we're, we're in? We're in 2013. Yeah, but what, 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 what year? Oh, three, I'm sorry. It's the, th it's the third year. Third year, five on years. This, on this uh, contract. And focusing for a moment on the on the office's accountability control and compliance program, FY14 uh, spending plan for training. For FY14, you allot forty-eight thousand for training, divided evenly over each quarter. Uh huh. Could you describe uh, what sorts of training your employees are receiving, Mr. Willoughby? Yes, the auditors. This may. Oh. Oh, well, the auditors are required under their standards of conduct. I think it's Yellow Book standards. Yellow, right? yellow Book. Yellow, mm -hmm. To um, uh, uh, receive training each year on an annual basis. Okay. So, so this is to keep their certifications. Right. To mm -hmm. is, it, is it sort of a standard training? Does that does it is it the same thing they get every single year, or is there something different? No, as long as they have the hours, the, the, necess the required hours, because I think every year they have to have so many hours in training. But it all have to be audit related or accounting related. Okay, so it could be different training that the- Yeah, exactly, I was gonna say, it's, it's something akin to like COE training for sure. attorneys, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay. That's what that's. Mm -hmm. And do you know how much um, of, of, of the program is expended on training in FY13 to date? To date? Uh, about thirty thousand. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, it's this twenty-two plus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the mayor's proposed budget, the allocation for the law enforcement and compliance program is six million. Uh, a little over six million dollars. However, in the FY14 spend plan you submitted to the council, you propose to spend uh, 5.983 million for the law enforcement and compliance program. Uh, and how do you account for the discrepancy of approximately 53,000 uh, from your spend plan? What was that from? 
Uh, could you repeat, repeat that, please? Sure. Uh, in the mayor's proposed budget, the allocation for law enforcement and compliance program is $6.036 million. And however, in the FY14 spend plan you submitted to the council, you propose to spend $5.983 million for the law enforcement and compliance program. Oh, okay. That was for FY13. Our proposed budget was 5.9, and FY14 is $6 million. He's saying one to the, where's the mayor's? What do this we, is, is this oh, that's right it yeah, Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the right? difference is because um, the 75 percent for the Medicaid fraud uh, uh, went up by, it increased by 106. That's the majority of the increase. But I'm, I'm still want to just clarify that the, that the, in the spend plan for FY14 that you submitted, it's not six million. It's actually it's it's 5.983 so there's a difference in the amount uh in the mayor's proposed budget wait, wait, and what you all actually wait a minute provided to the council 5.983 5 5.9 is the approved the mayor oh, okay six yes. point that may be the increase for the cost of living for the uh medicaid fraud because i think that did go up by fifty three thousand in there's so it may be the projected cost of living increase. Is there somewhere we can check on that? Right. So, so there's actually not an, an increase, and I was just oh. trying to get clarification. That's what right. I was thinking. Right. It's, it's an increase. increase. So it, it, you said it, it, it might reflect the cost of living. The projected cost of living for FY14. Would have been higher, not lower, correct? Right. That's why I'm fully on, on, on the same page. You're saying that what the mayor because proposed was 5.983? Well, the mayor proposed 6.036. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's for, um, um, that is our proposed budget okay. for FY14. But right. when you look at the FY14 spend plan. Oh, for the spend plan. Oh, sure. okay. So, so we're I'm, looking I'm just trying at to get a handle on what the, exactly. what the right. difference okay. between those so two numbers are. Okay. For the spending plan. It's approximately $53,000 that I'm trying to figure out. FY14, the law enforcement. You see it? Mm. And, and if you don't have the answer, I was going right to say, here, if you need to, we'll get back in touch sure, with yeah, you. We'll get back in touch with you. I mean, it's not a, it's not a huge amount. I'm exactly. just trying to, trying to reconcile the differences. No, I understand. Oh, okay. That's fine. So we'll get back to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the mayor's budget books uh, indicate that you propose to reduce investigation spending by 15000 in the law enforcement and compliance uh, program. I'm just wondering why the reduction. Okay, that, um, that 15000 is uh, contribute to uh, when we have vacancies, mm -hmm. we may be, um, fill them at a lower grade. Okay. So it's, it, it, it's uh, the difference between uh, gotcha. filling actual positions. Oh, yeah, this one is here. 6.036. Yeah. And you also, uh, in the proposed budget, add $106,000 to the Medicaid Fraud Control uh, Unit. Yes. And what does that increase represent? Okay, that includes their um, cost of living plus uh, within grades and uh, uh, increase for inflation. And also, yeah, I think that, that, that's tied in with the, 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 the testimony. Yeah, I know, but I know, but it's, it's tied in with the grant increase. By yes, the, uh huh. Program. So it represents the COLA and the inflation? It, right, exactly. And the within grades. Okay. And I noted in the FY14 law enforcement and compliance program, spend plan includes about 227000 for federal funds. I believe it's uh, 0309 building space. Federal funds, 0309 yes, building. And, and that's what, what does that Mifuku, represent? That's for Mifuku. Mifuku, 75% of their operating costs come from the federal government through grants. Okay. So that's where that. So that's the rent that they actually yeah. pay for. Oh, the okay. Space. Okay. Mm -hmm.
this year, and we oh, just yes. finished the second quarter of fiscal year 13. Um, where, where are you in terms of actuals for fringe benefits in FY13? Fringe benefits. And do you expect to come in on target? For are you on target or are we uh, Yes, we're at, um, as of the second quarter, we have, we have spent almost 50% of our budget. So, yeah, we are on target to spend at least 90% of our budget. And I want to shift your attention to uh, vacancies. In fiscal year 13, your agency received an increase of eight FTEs, going from 104 FTEs in fiscal year 12 to 112 FTEs in FY13. Your proposed FY14 budget retains 112 FTEs, but as of March 13, 2013, your agency reported 12 vacant positions, or the equivalent of 10 unfilled FTEs. And I wanted to know, and there's, there's several of them lifted out, um, if you could speak to those positions and, and, and three things, how long the positions have been vacant, why they're vacant, and whether or not you intend to fill those positions. Okay. Um, as, of, uh, as of today, we now have uh, nine vacant positions, but we currently have uh, advertised for five. So okay. we have... Which ones were, were filled in the, in the last, I guess, couple of weeks or so? Did you just make some hires? Okay. We have um, one uh, criminal investiga investigator under the, uh, the Medicaid fraud, and then we have one auditor that uh, is currently being advertised. And we have... No. Is, is the criminal investigator that you just mentioned... Is that being advertised or is that one of the recent hires? We, we, it shows for us, we, sh we show 12 vacancies, and you said there are we, we have nine. We have nine. We have nine currently. Nine currently. Okay. Yeah, so it's three of them. Oh, okay. Okay, so we have hired three because we have nine. Yeah. Oh, which three? Which three? Oh, we, investigator? The, the, the three was criminal investigator, right? If you could just say your name for the record, exactly. if you don't yes. mind. Um, Blanche Bruce, uh, uh, Deputy Inspector General. We recently put the mic. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Blanche Bruce, Deputy Inspector General. Is that on? So Press it. The light should be lit. The light. Push that. Push in the center. Yes. yes. Uh, Blanche Bruce. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on April the 8th, we hired an administrative officer. Um, on that same day, we hired a um, management analyst in the investigation division. And uh, today we hired a administrative uh, a management analyst in the inspection and the evaluation division. So we've had uh, three hires. We currently have five positions posted on the DCHR website. Uh, that would be uh, two investigators in the investigation division, one investigator in the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit, um, and one management author, analyst. a management analyst in the inspection and evaluation division and an auditor position. Okay. And that represents, what is that, eight? And so there's, I guess, four still vacant? Yes, what are the that's plans? correct. What are the plans that's for correct. those four vacancies? We okay. plan to advertise and to fill those positions. Okay. And do you know how long those, the four that haven't yet been advertised, how long they've been vacant? I'm sorry. How long have they been vacant? The, um, there's a position in the um, investigation division that's been uh, vacant since January the 1st of this year. Um, there is a, um, let me see. 
And if you don't, if you don't recall, yeah. okay. the, the, offhand, you don't, you don't don't. the offhand, and you can just get okay. back to us. I'm just so get curious back. as okay. to as to what are the remaining vacancies. Obviously, you've advertised for five, and you intend right. to hire. Uh, there are four uh, positions that remain vacant, uh, and, and if you can let us know uh, for those positions, uh, how long the position has been vacant, uh, why it's still vacant, and whether or not you intend to fill the position. I can tell you now that we plan to fill all the positions. <laughs> all right. Actually, I mean, your, your budget is, is, is pretty stable, and so yes. I didn't have a whole lot of questions no. for, for you, uh, Mr. Willoughby. Uh, I do appreciate your testimony here today. Do you have any, anything that you want to add to the record uh, before we conclude the hearing? No. Uh, um, um, I guess I, I will say this um, in reference to, I guess, um, some of the, the, the public testimony. We do acknowledge the receipt of complaints that come in. Um, we have an automated system if it comes in via email. We do have a number of outreach. I do go out in the community myself. I mean, I go out to a number of senior seminars. I've gone out to some A and C meetings, that sort of thing. The other thing I think it's important, and because I understand the concern, particularly I guess with respect to Ms. Hobby, we did attempt to provide assistance. We cannot represent individuals individually in their personal administrative matters that they have. But we do try to use the, the resources at our disposal to assist her. And I think she indicated that by the fact she indicated we've done at least two audits. Um, I met personally um, with Ms. Hobby's group um, several, a couple of years ago, and we were trying to explore ways that we could provide assistance. Um, and I say that because in addition to what our mission statement is, uh, 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 is I also believe the office has a role as a facilitator, that in those areas where we don't really have authority, or, uh, um, or um, either enforcement or otherwise to do anything, I try to assist citizens by, if, if something comes is brought to our attention, we'll refer it to the appropriate entity and, and, and let the, the citizen know that we've so referred it. Instead of just kicking it back to the citizen, we've gone ahead and referred it to the entity because I believe that many times the fact that an IG's office is raising an issue with an entity that may be outside of our jurisdiction will carry more weight than if just a lay person. So we try to facilitate as best we can, and I just want to, to put that on, on, on the record. Mr. Tali Hobby, as well as Mr. Sindra mentioned that uh, oftentimes they receive information that is so redacted, uh, and, and to paraphrase, uh, for them it's, it's almost not useful um, just because they can't really discern, I guess, the information. And, and I try to uh, explain um, just from my own experience why agencies tend to redact information that they provide to the public. Do you want to speak to that at all as to why? Yes, because generally, I can tell you, we have a public version, so we try to cut down on redactions. Where you may get redactions is when you make a FOIA request, and that's something that's told to people where if they come in, we tell them that we don't give status reports for obvious reasons. And so, and, and we will tell them face to face that um, we don't give status reports, but at, but at the appropriate time, you can make a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request, and we will respond with the documentation to give you some sense of how we're proceeding or, or how the matter was concluded. Um, with regard to um, uh, um, written FOIA requests, again, um, if you get a document, the document may be redacted, but it's usually going to be redacted, as you've indicated, to protect the identity of the individual um, and to maintain the confidentiality of it. But um, but, our, but we, we try to um, have different versions so that you, you're not looking at a document that's heavily redacted. Okay, and I know there's some uh, enhancements that you all are, are seeking to, to make around technology. I, I would just encourage you, like I encourage uh, uh, many of the agencies within the uh, purview of the Government Operations Committee, just to uh, just bear in mind that it's, it's helpful uh, as the public seeks to interact with their government um, that uh, the processes in terms of getting information and really trying to communicate are user-friendly to the extent they can be. Not that oh, you yeah. haven't done that, yeah. but if there are ways to sort of enhance uh, the ability for public to really interact, uh, just to sort of 
bear that in mind as you continue in your operations. Uh, we have, and, and, and I will end on this note, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the last um, hearing, the, the, uh, a reference, someone raised questions regarding um, not getting adequate information regarding whistleblower and whatever other protections. We have since that time put on our website a frequently asked questions section that is operational now um, where that should provide guidance and direction to, um, um, to, to, to the citizenry. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I don't have anything else. I really appreciate each of your testimony here this okay. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to move on to the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. Uh, but before we call up our public witnesses, uh, I just want to say that the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability was created uh, just 18 months ago to administer and enforce the D.C. government's code of conduct and to ensure government compliance with the district's Freedom of Information Act. The agency operates through two programs, the Office of Government Ethics and the Open Government Office, which are both overseen by the Board of Ethics. The Board of Ethics is comprised of three directors who are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council. In these early months of the agency's life, the board was responsible for hiring directors to oversee the Office of Government Ethics and the Open Government Office. Each of these directors is now in place, and I expect that the agency will be fully operational within the next few months. The Office of Government Ethics is charged with investigating and adjudicating violations of the district's code of conduct, which governs the ethical conduct of employees and public officials, including the conduct of the council and the mayor. Under Director Dan Sobin's management, the office has hired seven employees and is now operational and carrying out its mission. The other arm of the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability is the Open Government Office. The task of the Open Government Office is to ensure the district's compliance with the Freedom of Information Act and resolve disputes between agencies and the public regarding access to government records. This office is not yet up and running, although I understand that it is close to operational, and I look forward to hearing more about that today. Uh, this is the first budget oversight hearing of the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability since its creation, and Vega's proposed FY 2014 gross budget is $1,218,883 which represents a 17.3% increase over its FY 2013 approved gross budget of $1,039,000. And now we'll turn to uh, our public witnesses, if there are any uh, who wishes to testify. I note that we had uh, three witnesses who, who had signed up to testify, Dorothy Brazil, Michael Syndrome, and John Rosser. I don't believe any of them are present. And so we're going to go ahead and move on to our government witnesses. Robert Spagnoletti, who's chairman of the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability, and as well as two directors, Darren Sobin and Tracy Hughes. And if each of you can remain standing and raise your right hand, please. Do you uh, each swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. And you can begin whenever you're ready. Mr. Spagnoletti. Good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie. <clears throat> I'm Robert Spagnoletti, Chair of the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. And I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our budget needs for fiscal year 2014. As you know, the Board's mission is to foster high ethical standards for district government employees and strengthen the public's confidence that the government's business is conducted with impartiality, integrity, and transparency. The Board oversees both the Office of Government Ethics and the Office of Open Government. The Office of Government Ethics, or OGE, is responsible for administering the district's code of conduct, receiving, investigating, and adjudicating violations, training district employees on ethics standards, 
issuing rules and best practices reports governing district employees and public officials, administering the financial disclosure and lobbyist registration systems, and providing formal and informal ethics advice. I have with me here today Darren Sobin, the Director of Government Ethics, who can provide more details about OGE's operations and budgetary needs. I'm also very pleased to introduce Tracy Hughes, the first Director of the Office of Open Government, who started this morning. She can also provide some thoughts on her vision for the Office of Open Government. Also with us is James Hurley, who is our financial manager. The last fiscal year, this last fiscal year was the first for our board. The board members, Deborah Lathan, Laura Richards, and I were confirmed by the council on July 10th, 2012, and were sworn in by Mayor Gray two days later. Pursuant to the act establishing the board, we were to begin operations and commence enforcement of the Code of Conduct on October 1st, 2012 which coincided nicely with the new fiscal year. In the six months since we have commenced operations, I'm proud to report that we've accomplished all of our goals for the first year of operations. We have fully staffed the Office of Government Ethics and have hired Ms. Hughes for the open government position. More, moreover, the OGE is fully functioning and engaged daily in all the tasks it was set up to do. Formal ethics advisory opinions are being issued and published. Investigations are proceeding expeditiously and are resulting in dispositions, including our first fines for violation of the Code of Conduct. Ethics training is ongoing. The district's ethics manual has been updated and posted. The lobbyists have been registered, and the financial disclosure statement electronic filing system has been successfully migrated to our board, tested, and deployed in time for the upcoming May 15th deadline. With all of this on, going on, the OGE staff also found time to complete the very first ethics best practices report, which was issued last week and contains recommendations for future ethics reform. I know that during our planning stages in 2011, there was, there was a serious attempt to estimate the financial needs of setting up the office and providing it with resources necessary to ca carry out its many responsibilities. I think those planners did an excellent job at coming close to the mark in the absence of any empirical evidence. Even with some indication now, it's difficult to predict our needs 18 months out, considering we only have six, six months of data. I very much appreciate that the mayor's budget gives us a 17% increase from FY 2013. That increase reflects the additional FTE of one senior level attorney to handle Hatch Act matters, which were recently made part of the Code of Conduct and given to our board for enforcement. Prior to this, Hatch Act advice and enforcement belonged to the Office of Special Counsel of the federal government. Even with this increase, however, I believe that both the Office of Government Ethics and the Office of Open Government will need additional staff in 2014. The volume of matters for OGE increases almost daily, and Mr. Sobin can give you some comparisons to other governmental entities with similar responsibilities. He is asking for an additional staff assistant and, an, and another attorney for a total of 11 FTEs. As for Open Government, that office is budgeted currently for only one FTE, and that's the director herself. She needs at least two additional FTEs for that office to function effectively in the coming year. And with those FTEs, we would propose to staff the office with one attorney and one technology specialist. I'd like now to defer to Mr. Sobin, who can speak more specifically on his budgetary needs, and then to Ms. Hughes, who, of course, it is day one for her, but she can talk briefly about her early vision for the Office of Open Government. And we would then be pleased to answer any questions that, the, um, uh, that you may have about the board and its operations. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chairman Spagnoletti. My name is Darren Sobin, the Director of Government Ethics. Uh, and thank you for those comments. Uh, I have given a great deal of thought to the staffing needs of the Office of Government Ethics. I can say at this moment that my current staffing is inadequate to accomplish all the responsibilities with which I've been entrusted. I say this not only because of our current caseload, but because of the expected increase in work as BEGA becomes better known and because of comparisons to other entities with similar functions. BEGA has ethics oversight of roughly 34,000 district employees and government officials, not to mention the several hundred lobbyists and ANC commissioners as well. Since we started operations at the end of 2012, we have received 32 complaints, opened 26 investigations, closed 15 of them, and as of today are actively investigating 11 others. Several of these have resulted in sanctions, including the imposition of our first fine of $500. We also have used our subpoena authority, when needed, to further our investigative efforts. 
We have issued 14 formal advisory opinions, which either have been published and posted on our website or are awaiting publication. Mr. Spagnoletti already mentioned our other responsibilities, including lobbyist registration and financial disclosure statement filing and oversight, as well as producing the annual best practices report. The best practices report, which was issued last week, was a months-long endeavor commencing with a public symposium that we sponsored in January. With the assistance of pro bono outside counsel, OGE staff worked for months reviewing national best practices and government ethics law. Our 30-page report covers a number of different topics, including post-employment, nepotism, and a recommendation for a universal code of conduct, which BEGA would draft. In terms of lobbyist registration, we are creating from scratch an audit plan so that in the near future we can begin substantive reviews on a sample basis of lobbyist activity reports. In the meantime, we are reviewing the reports that have been filed for consistency and in case there's any red flags. Further, the OGE staff has completed seven ethics trainings for agency ethics counselors, advisory neighborhood commissions, and agency staff, with another scheduled for later this week. Uh, there is one going on right now uh, for the ANC commissioners uh, over at uh, 441. Uh, the more recent of these ethics trainings have included sections on financial disclosure statement filings in the local Hatch Act, which, as uh, Chairman Spagnoletti said, is now under BEGA's jurisdiction. Uh, these ethics trainings have led to a direct increase in verbal requests for informal advice, particularly from the agency ethics counselors whose roles have changed uh, and are required to limit their advice to well-settled principles of law and those issues on which formal written advisory opinions have been issued. Handling all this work is my dedicated staff of seven, my general counsel, two junior attorneys, two investigators, and two administrative assistants. It's not enough. In attempting to predict our staffing needs, I sought a model of an entity with similar responsibilities. Because we are somewhat unique, it was difficult. The most useful comparison I could find was the DC Bar's disciplinary system for lawyers, made up of the Board on Professional Responsibility and its prosecutor's office, the Office of Bar Counsel. With an $8 million budget, the Board and the Office of Bar Counsel have a combined staff of 44. The Office of Bar Counsel alone has 17 attorneys, 12 administrative staff, three investigators, a staff attorney, and several law clerks. The Board on Professional Responsibility has nine members and nine employees, including attorneys and an executive director. To be sure, the D.C. Bar has more members practicing in the district than there are D.C. government employees, uh, 51,883 versus uh, our 34,000 number. However, I should point out that the Bar's disciplinary system engages only in enforcement proceedings, unlike BEGA, which also must provide advice, training, and the other tasks that I mentioned. One of those other tasks, financial disclosure filing oversight, provides a good example of how we are understaffed. I understand that when those responsibilities belong to the Office of Campaign Finance, uh, three full-time employees were needed to operate the system effectively. Uh, I have only one individual who also serves as the BEGA receptionist. At the moment, we are keeping up with our tasks. Advisory opinions are being issued in a timely fashion. Investigations are proceeding, and my entire staff is pitching in to implement the financial disclosure filing system, including notification, so that district employees and officials can meet the May 15th filing deadline. And I will note that uh, all letters went out on Friday uh, about how to use the new electronic filing system. Um, I got mine on Saturday morning, so I know they're being received. Um, and uh, I can speak more about that uh, if you have any questions. My biggest concern, though, is what will happen when our investigations result in adversarial proceedings. In the several months since we have been staffed and operating, I've been very fortunate to resolve investigations either by dismissal or by negotiated disposition without the need to have a full-blown evidentiary hearing. That is not going to last. Uh, I have several investigations that are nearing completion which are likely to result in adversarial proceedings. And as a former trial attorney, I'm fully aware of the time and resources that it'll take to bring a case through a trial or, in this case, an adversarial proceeding. 
Moreover, aside from our usual code of conduct violations, I am informed by my colleagues at the Office of Campaign Finance that we can expect an average of 200 enforcement proceedings annually just for noncompliance with the financial disclosure filings. My other concern is that our current caseload at the moment manageable is due to BEGA still being new and relatively unknown to many government employees. I say this because each time we go out to an agency to conduct training, our complaints and requests for advice noticeably increase immediately thereafter. That trend is likely to continue as we ramp up our training program and our enforcement actions increase. With all of this in mind, I believe that my request for two additional FTEs beyond what is called for in the Mayor's FY 2014 proposed budget, a single additional administrative assistant and an additional attorney, junior, I guess, uh, is certainly reasonable. And I'm pleased to answer any questions the Board may have. I'm sorry. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, as I mentioned before, with us today is Tracy Hughes, who starts today as the Director of the Office of Open Government. And I, I had the chance to speak with her last week to let her know the hearing was going to be today, and even though there, she does not have prepared testimony, but at least to spend a minute or two to discuss her vision of the office and how she would use the proposed staffing. Um, as you know, the Office of Open Government used to be within the Office of Campaign Finance before it was moved to our board with the creation of the board, where it was never staffed and never operational. And so we're, we're writing on a blank slate here. Um, it's an important area. Uh, you and I both had the, the privilege of attending the Open Government Coalition, uh, the DC Government Open Go Coalition Summit that they had a few weeks ago where we dis got discussed and heard some t statistics about the lack of compliance with the Open Meetings Act, concerns about FOIA, concerns that folks have about the transparency of government. So we have the opportunity to start fresh with this office um, and get it right from the beginning. So um, I'll ask Ms. Hughes to, again, sure. it's early, but to give us some, some early thoughts about her <laughs> vision of that office. No, I, I look forward to hearing uh, uh, her testimony. I know there are a number of folks in the advocacy community who are excited to know that you all uh, had hired uh, someone to fill the position. So um, please, Ms. Hughes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Spagnoletti, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here this afternoon. Um, I have to say that amongst my highest priorities um, will be to first gauge the community on ways in which they would like to receive information, um, in addition to the ease of access to uh, government he uh, hearings um, and then also agency meetings. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting on the board of the um, D.C. Open Government Coalition, so I'm intimately aware of the many issues that do exist. Um, Additionally, technology is a key priority and making sure that there's the proper infrastructure in place um, for not only creating an automated system of receiving FOIA requests, but then also ensuring that um, any and all materials that um, may arise as a result of um, agency meetings, um, uh, additional um, government meetings are made accessible to the public. Um, that being said, I also realize that we need to meet our district residents where they are. Um, many of our district residents um, may not utilize technology in the ways um, that um, all of us do in this room. Um, so um, offering ways where individuals can receive information in um, many different um, forms so that we can make sure that every district government resident um, believes that they do in fact have access to information and to district government and there is a clear sense of transparency. Mr. Chairman, I would just point out also that um, Ms. Hughes is not a stranger to the district government. She served both within the office of the Attorney General when I was the Attorney General but also with um, MPD and has particular insight into the complexities of um, FOIA, transparency, um, what the public needs to know, wants to know. She's got a journalism background, so she understands the media's need for information as well. So we, she brings a wealth of experience and can hit the ground running. And we could not be more thrilled to have her back in the district government. Okay. Well, again, I appreciate your testimony, Ms. Hughes, as well as the testimony of, of you, Mr. Sobin, as well as you, Mr. Spagnoletti. Uh, I have a, a few questions uh, for you uh, this afternoon, and I want to begin by talking about in FY12 and 13, uh, 
Vega initiated $200,000 in reprogramming uh, each year from personal services and non-personal services funds. And I think I have an, uh, an idea of, of what that's about, but I'd like to, to, to see if you all could please explain uh, why these reprograms were necessary. Sure. So the, we were, as I mentioned before, we were sworn in in July. Um, and at that point, there was no board. Um, there was nothing. So we had no space. We had no supplies. We had no computers. We had no anything. But because there was funding for uh, uh, personal services for the previous fiscal year, for 2012, we wanted to make as much use as we possibly could out of that money so that we could use it for startup costs to, you know, to buy stuff, if you will, and it had a very small NPS budget. So we asked for the reprogramming in 2012 for that reason. Same thing really for the beginning of 2013. The things that we couldn't get because we were starting on October 1 with no personnel um, because we hadn't hired anybody yet, we had lapsing uh, salary funds. And we wanted to make the most effective use and efficient use of the money that we did have. We had to do, a, we had to do some um, renovation in the space that was given to us by DGS over at 441 Fourth Street. We had technology needs. We also significantly had to migrate the financial disclosure and lobbyist registration system, the online system, from Office of Campaign Finance to us and make all the changes to comply with the new law. And that was not a cheap proposition. Fortunately, DataNet had done all the work getting the system up and running, so it was a matter of getting it migrated over, but it still was a substantial outlay of funds that had not been budgeted for before. So we took advantage of the lapsing salary funds as we were hiring folks to move that over. And so we managed with careful management by um, Mr. Hurley and, and um, Mr. Awan getting us balanced between the uh, NPS and, and salary budget. And with respect to the Open Government Office's budget, um, I think that there's a, an accounting shift taking place between FY13 and FY14. And if you could please make clear for the record why it appears that the Open Government Office is losing 627000 between FY13 and FY14. Yeah, this is, this is more of a um, sort of technical glitch, if you will, from the budget before. When we were, when we were project before we were in existence, when they built the 2012 budget, um, they put the bodies that were supposed to be with the Office of Government Ethics underneath the Office of Open Government. There was some confusion about the way in which we would be set up. So they put, I believe it was seven persons originally in the Office of Open Government that really belonged with the Office of Government Ethics because there was nobody in the Office of Open Government, so didn't really, they didn't need to have seven people to start off with. So it's really just a matter of flip-flopping, if you will, the numbers around. So it looks like there's a loss, but really it's just on the other side of the house. Okay, and and we we if we could discuss the growth in bigger staff in FY13 and propose FY14 budgets. So, so I'll, as I'm you, sorry. I was going to say, as you mentioned, you, you recently hired Miss Hughes, who's with us today, and she gave us an idea of what her vision was uh, or is for the Office of Open Government. Um, but I'd like to give an opportunity at this point to discuss uh, what, if any, budgetary constraints. Uh, she foresees as she sets up her office. Right. It's just or if you want to, if you want to speak to it, uh, Mr. Chairman, then feel free to do so. Sure. I, I may have a little bit more insight only because she's brand new. But, right. but again, right. it's sure. it's, it's going to be Ms. Hughes' office. Um, really, the, the, I think the most immediate need is for some personnel support. Um, we, in a meeting that we had last week, we discussed at some length what the priority was going to be. And as Ms. Hughes mentioned, getting out in the community and getting to government agencies to hear both what the needs are, what the barriers are, is job one. But, but we have now seen on the ethics side of the house that we, we are getting daily calls for advice, for guidance, for interpretations of the law. Um, and Ms. Hughes will be no different. I mean, the Office of Open Government, we are already receiving, and, and the board members are handling requests for interpretation about whether or not a meeting should be open or not, whether it can be closed or not, what needs to be posted, how it needs to be posted, who in OCTA do I need a contact to be posted. That's not Mr. Sobin's responsibility, so currently it's, that falls on the board. It's about to become Ms. Hughes' responsibility. But in order to, to um, manage the day-to-day -day operations of the Office of Open Government, answer all of those questions, um, give advice and guidance to the you know hundreds of uh, sub-components that the, that the Open Meetings Act applies to in the district, she will be able to do that and go out and meet with the public and agency directors and draft 
uh, recommended changes in the law, and na navigate FOIA disputes amongst agencies all at the same time. So the priority is get a staff attorney in there who can handle the day-to-day, -day, answer the phone, give advice about agendas and meetings and what needs to be posted, what doesn't need to be posted, um, start to do the best practices research on the open government side, and a technology specialist who can then begin um, working on the global FOIA system that we would envision. And the board has spoken about it some length in our public meetings where all FOIA requests to the district are managed centrally and that at some point all of the responsive information, the documents are posted centrally so that once you do it once, you don't have to do it again and they're easily accessed. The federal government has a similar system in, in different places. Um, uh, but we need, to, and then also we can troubleshoot the technology issues with the individual, uh, the boards and the commissions. What we've learned, interestingly, is that many of the questions that we're getting are barrier questions. What I mean by that is, you know, there's a commission that sits under the auspices of some agency. They would love to be able to post their agenda, but they don't control the agency's website. And the person who controls the agency website doesn't really know what that particular board or commission does and doesn't know what goes up, where it goes, where you find it on their website, how it gets posted, and then the public gets frustrated because they don't have an easy way to find it. And if you don't happen to know that the Public Space Commission sits within the Department of Transportation, so I'm, I'm using that just sort of off the top of my head. If you don't know that off the top of your head, it's how do you find it? And for, as Ms. Hughes said, you have to meet people where they are, and a lot of folks, they're not as facile with the searching. You know, you've got to figure out a way to get this out there. We're supposed to be transparent. And a technology specialist can help right, break down some of those barriers. I think that we want to be reasonable. You know, I, I, in terms of our request, we're trying to project our needs of what's going to start in October of next year. Ms. Hughes will then, have, you know, she's got six months to kind of get the vision going and get the groundwork laid to by the time that we would have funding, hopefully, for these people. She'd know the positions would be drafted, the vacancies would be ready to be posted on October 1, get somebody right in the door. And the one thing I will say is I think the board has demonstrated that when given the resources, we use them. We're not wasting any of our money. We don't have vacancies. The one vacancy we do have currently is only because it's a brand new position. Right. And it will be filled. We have a number of applicants already and interviews are going to be starting. And, and recently the council passed emergency legislation delegating enforcement responsibility for the local Hatch Act to, to your office. And I know you mentioned in your testimony that you're going to hire a person that the mayor's budget includes an FTE for that purpose. But uh, is there anything else uh, in terms of uh, having this enhanced set of responsibilities that is going to impact the, the Vegas budget that, that we should know about. I think Mr. Sobin can speak to that. Uh, the question was whether there are additional things besides the Hatch sure. Act. I think I spoke a little well, bit about just no things that are going to be associated with the new responsibility of enforcing the Hatch Act. Well, I met, I met last week with the Office of Special Counsel. Um, the federal body which used to enforce our Hatch Act and because I wanted to get an idea of what it was we could expect. Uh, they're compiling the numbers for me now. They don't, they had some problem breaking them out um, uh, from just DC folks, but they said it was significant uh, and it's uh, that we can expect to, once the word gets out that we're handling it, uh, there should be a, a significant amount of work to do. We have one active investigation going on already as a Hatch Act matter. We, uh, in this special election uh, season, we've been getting lots and lots of calls uh, for advice. Uh, we've been uh, conducting trainings uh, on the uh, new Hatch Act, um, the requirements. Updated I think we've done. Updated the manual as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, updated the manual. Yeah, oh yeah, and uh, certainly we updated the ethics manual to reflect the new Hatch Act. So that's all been updated and posted. Um, so we'll see where where the Hatch Act uh, goes. Uh, but uh, again, in addition to that, my my concern really is as we try to right size what this office is supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> the more we get out there in the public the more inquiries and the more matters we're getting. I mean, it's, it's almost scary to see how, you know, once people know about us, how quickly things come in. And the ethics counselors and the agencies, you know, again, while they've been a great help, uh, and it was a great idea to keep them in place, you know, by law, they're no longer able to do what they used to do, which was to provide safe harbor advice. So you get a lot of instances where people in the agencies, uh, 
you know, would rather not deal with the agency ethics counselor if what they tell them is not binding. So they'd rather just call us. With, with the addition of the, the attorney who was going to handle uh, enforcement of the Hatch Act, how many FTEs would, would the office have in total? Uh, with the addition of that individual, uh, Office of Government Ethics then would have nine. Um, that, yep, that's right, nine. And then one with, with uh, Ms. Hughes's addition. For the board total, it's going to be 10 FTEs? Well, then, if at the moment, but if we got the additional two, obviously, then it would go up to 12. And beyond the director of the Open Government Office, has Vega um, hired anyone else since we held our performance oversight hearing in February? Um, I th just I think just the the receptionist, right? Yeah, He's also the, handling the financial disclosure. Yeah, we hired a, an additional administrative staff assistant just to do the um, financial disclosure filings to sit at the front. And I, I believe you said this already, but just just so I'm clear. Uh, in addition to the Hatch Act attorney, uh, there there aren't any other vacancies currently. No. no. Nope. And and as I said, that vacancy is posted, and um, we've received a num a fair. Each time we post a vacancy, the numbers of people who apply grow. We had 20 candidates for Ms. Hughes' position, so oh, the word is getting out there. That's great. If I can, also just both for comparison purposes, I think Mr. Sobin said to date, you know, since we opened our doors in October, we've had 30 some odd complaints, investigations going on. Um, as I understand it from the Office of Campaign Finance, the entire previous year they had seven. So that should give you some sense of, um, as Mr. Sobin said, as the word gets out, the um, activity increases. Sure, and I, and I want to delve a little deeper into your request for additional FTEs. Mm -hmm. uh, Chairman Spagnoletti, you referenced that the uh, OGE and the Open Government Office will each need two FTEs, I believe, in your testimony. And Director Sobin, you outlined uh, an array of responsibilities that are developing in your office uh, as the agency profile grows. Uh, would you all please, uh, for the committee, uh, outline specifically what positions you are requesting? I know you've done so already for the uh, Office of Open Government. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but, Mr. Sobin, perhaps you can speak to what, what the responsibilities would be. Yeah, let, let me uh, just say this. Uh, the Hatch Act attorney, or what we've called the Hatch Act attorney position, is a very senior level position. It would be my only senior uh, attorney uh, that I would have, except for, of course, my general counsel. Um, but this individual, although we're calling he or she a Hatch Act attorney, uh, we're all sharing Hatch Act uh, responsibilities right now. This individual we would also envision as being uh, a, uh, an individual uh, that would be held apart from the investigation so that they could be available to the board to help them with their findings of fact, inclusions of law, and adversarial proceedings. Uh, as it stands right now, we have a bit of a conflict problem because for instance, if we go to uh, an adversarial proceeding, uh, as the prosecutor, uh, I should not be in a position uh, of me or my other staff who were involved in the best investigation uh, drafting the findings of fact and conclusions of law. So we would be following the uh, ABRA model uh, where uh, the director there uses one of his attorneys uh, to assist the board and keep that attorney away from the investigations but to do all the other stuff. So really that's that's what I'm envisioning for that position. So I would need the two other FTEs. One, of course, would be administrative to help uh, with the financial disclosure filings. Uh, again, I think OCF had three people that were uh, just doing that. Um, and then a, a junior attorney that could help out with the increased volume in investigations. Um, and again, noting that the senior attorney that we'd be hiring now would really not be able to do investigations, uh, we would need you know another attorney to, uh, more junior attorney that I could plug in uh, to take over those uh, those responsibilities that the Hatch Act attorney wouldn't be able to do. And with the uh, the FTE who would perform so sort of the administrative functions related to the financial disclosures, in their testimony. Um, the Office of Campaign Finance said they had three FTEs, but that uh, neither of them were uh, exclusively 
uh, dedicated to the financial disclosures. Do you envision your FTE to be exclusively devoted? Yeah, to let me just say one thing about that. I think there might have been con some confusion about that because I was in the back listening. Uh, when we called them up, we specifically asked them if you had to, we need to go to the council and ask you know, for enough resources to do our financial disclosure filing. You know, if you had to put a number on the number of FTEs that do your financial disclosure filing, what would it be? And they said three. So that's where I got that number from. Uh, I think when I heard them speak up here, they were talking about seven individuals that had something to do with financial disclosure filings. Uh, and I think it sort of came to a, you know, if you had to put a number on it, it would be three full-timers. Uh, and with 200 enforcement actions, I don't see how it could be any less than three. I mean, that's a huge number of noncompliance enforcement actions that they were handling every year that we're now going to get. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to, uh, to try to draw out from them whether or not they were talking about three full-time FTEs. And what I got was, in addition to the financial disclosures, they said they had a number of, of FTEs who, in addition to doing the financial disclosure work, also did the work around the lobbyists. Uh, registration and reporting and some other area as well so they were they were sort of sharing those responsibilities and overlapping as related to those three areas uh, in addition to some other duties and so mm -hmm. I just wasn't clear if, if, if well actually I was clear from them that they didn't have three full-time FDE specifically doing the financial disclosures but it really didn't give me a gauge for how how much work it would take for a person who might be dedicated to simply doing the financial disclosure. Right. I, I think it's three, uh, and I think that's what it's going to bear out as we go forward. Uh, I, I'm willing to try it with two for now. Okay. And you all wrapped up your hiring over the course of FY13, uh, meaning that some of the positions that were budgeted in FY13 were not filled at the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, and do you all expect to have any, any surplus at the end of FY13 uh, from unspent salary allocation? No, no. We, the, the salaries that were budgeted originally were fairly low compared to what we can actually hire folks at. Um, you know, we have our attorneys, as Mr. Sobin said, we have two attorneys who are, are junior, um, and we try to balance that out. But, it, but just as a practical matter, we don't expect any we don't expect any lapsed salary money at the end of the year. And there, there are several relatively small increases in your budget as it relates to personal services. Uh, your proposed FY14 budget requests a $15,000 increase for Board of Government Ethics members' stipends. Now, uh, what's the current stipend given to board members? I, I think mine is 26500 Yes, the chairman is twenty six five, and the other two members uh, each are at twelve five. That's the current stipend. Uh, I believe there's a note in, as you say, in the um, <clears throat> language in the chapter that suggests that there will be an increase. And uh, I believe somewhere along the way uh, that was picked up and it's uh, incorrect information. Uh, through the Office of Budget and Planning, we're going to uh, amend the chapter, or change that language um, so that is incorrect. The increase is associated with their NPS budget, uh, not not salaries. Okay. So, so there's no proposed increase in the stipends. Yeah, can no. okay. It's statutory. Yes. And there's no desire to increase the stipend. <laughs> I, take it. I won't say that. <laughs> okay. To be clear. And it, uh, the, the biggest fringe benefit growth rate adjustment is slated to be 4.2 percent, uh, or about $6,200. What's included uh, in the fringe benefits? Well, the fringe benefit growth rate, uh, again, is uh, uh, calculated by looking historically, uh, usually at what the fringe benefit rates have been for agencies, but then looking forward as to what inflationary pressures might impact that. The biggest one, of course, is the, the health care for employees. You also have an optical plan, a dental plan. You also have FICA that's in there, the federal money, as well as Medicare percentage, retirement. All of that is lumped together as fringe benefit, and the forecasted increase for next year is about 4.2%.
And I also noted that the uh, the the rental land instructions budget is decreasing by twenty two thousand dollars in, in FY fourteen. And, uh, and was would like for you to explain uh, why this funding is no longer necessary. Well, again, I think uh, originally when the planning was done for this agency uh, at the stage in which uh, the administration and the council committee were looking at the formulation of the new board, it wasn't really clear where it was going to be located, in which office setting. So I think um, there was some uh, quick analysis done that suggested if they had to rent space that it would cost that amount. Uh, I guess subsequently there was a decision made for the agency to locate it at 441, in other words, one judiciary square. So there's no direct uh, budget for FY14 for their space. It's all handled by the Department of General Services. And, you know, given that the, uh, the office is, is growing rather rapidly, uh, do you all feel that the facilities as they are currently are adequate? Um, DGS has been very good with us in terms of helping us deal with our space needs. Um, we had to renovate a little bit the space that they gave us, and they have identified an additional hear a, a hearing room on the fifth floor that's already a hearing room with a big dais, which will allow us to convert our smaller hearing room into additional offices. And that will, with that, with those two spaces, that will meet our needs for the upcoming fiscal year. And, and now lobbyists are, are required to register with the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability to pay a registration fee. And when did uh, Bigger begin accepting lobbyist registrations? January. January. And what's the registration fee per lobbyist? Three uh, Off the top of my head, I, mean, I the, uh, I believe the fee is at two hundred and fifty and fifty dollars if it's nonprofit. So for profit is at one level. And nonprofits, a, a lower level. And can you tell me how much uh, you all have collected thus far? Uh, the office, on an annual basis, collects around sixty thousand, fifty to sixty in that range, and it's usually about this time of the year in which the revenue starts flowing in. So. I can't give you today's number, but sure. we would expect, uh, you know, for this current fiscal year to collect in that fifty-five, maybe sixty thousand dollar range. And, and what are the funds generated from the fee used for? It, I, mean, I think, yeah, it's, we generally, I, I think historically they've been used by Office of Campaign Finance to um, support the uh, electronic filing system for both lobbyist registration as well as financial disclosures, and we anticipate doing the same. And actually, you know, I'm sort of wrapping up. I don't have very many questions, but I did want to ask, uh, or at least note, that you all are required by statute to produce a number of reports, uh, which you mentioned some, uh, Mr. Bagdalati, in your testimony, including online quarterly reports, an ethics manual, and an ethics best practices report. Uh, have, have you all contracted out any of the work related to producing these reports? No, although we have had pro bono assistance in drafting the best practices report, but we've not engaged, we do our own reporting. Um, and, you know, even our quarterly reporting on investigations and outcomes, that we do that ourselves. We, it's all in-house. And, and going forward, uh, do you intend to contract any of the work out in the future? I, I don't anticipate so. All right, well, I don't have any, any additional questions. Is there anything else that either of you would like to add to the record? I would just like to uh, thank you and the, and the committee for your support. I know that we are a new startup operation here, but um, we've been very, very fortunate to have the support of the council as well as the executive in getting you know the space and the resources that we need to at least become functional and operational. And I think we're at a good point where we can start to see um, you know what the future holds for us. Obviously, it may require some more resources, but I think that we've got a very good start and. Um, two terrific directors to get us moving. So, again, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you uh, Chairman Spagnoletti, for your testimony here today. And thank you, uh, Ms. Hughes and Mr. Sovin. Uh,
uh, as well uh, for your testimony this afternoon. I do not have any additional questions. I hope you all have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. just concluded uh, the budget oversight hearings for the Committee on Government Operations, and the time is now 1.32 p.m. The next hearing on the Committee on Government Operations is going to be uh, on Thursday, April 25th, from 1.23 at 10 a.m. Again, the time is now 1.32 p.m. And this hearing is adjourned.